Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Dave Casuto, instructor for Learn It, and welcome to our intro to Illustrator class. I'm so excited to be teaching you all all of the amazing tools that Illustrator has to offer. Now, what will you learn, you ask? Well, being an intro class, we're going to just start from the basics, understanding the tools, panels, and Illustrator workspace, how to create a new document, then we're gonna move on to how to use all of the fancy selection tools, including the elusive direct selection tool. We'll also cover vector illustration using shapes, the pen and pencil tool, applying brush strokes and saving swatches and gradients. We'll also do a deep dive into type and topography and show you all the tips, shortcuts, and tricks to make you more proficient and more creative using Illustrator. Now, this course is designed to be an interactive hands-on course. So occasionally you'll hear me say, hey, pause the video and practice on your own. So make sure you download the class files from the link below to do so. This will ensure you get the most out of the course and learn the program in a more experiential hands-on manner. Now I'm looking forward to teaching you all the cool things that Illustrator has to offer. So stay tuned and get ready to learn. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you wanna earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. And as I mentioned, this course does have exercise files and you'll find them in the video description below. So where should we begin? Let's imagine that this is our first day of medical school and we need to know where all the body parts are. We need to know our anatomy, so when we are doing an examination where we're doing some kind of surgery, we need, need to know where things are. In Illustrator and a lot of Adobe programs, we have something called our workspace. This current workspace is called the Essentials Workspace. And that essentially is giving us our tools over here on the left-hand side as one column. And you can see over here on the right-hand side, I have my properties, I have my layers panel, and I have my libraries panel. Now, if you click over here in the far upper right, you're gonna see this little dude right there. When you click on that, you're gonna see all of these different individual workspace types. So depending on what you're doing, you may have a variety of different preset workspaces. These are things that Illustrator just gives to us. So if I were to change this, let's just say to topography, everything's gonna change dramatically to look very different. Let's try another one. I click on this, let's go over here to painting. And look at that, a lot of very, very different stuff. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go right back to Essentials. And I'm gonna click on that again. I'm gonna say Reset Essentials. In case I've made some modifications to that, it is all set back to where the default is. Okay, now what we're gonna learn how to do is pretty much just customize these things. So in the upper, upper left-hand side, you're gonna see that little double arrow right there. That is essentially gonna allow me to make this go from one column to two columns, because I really like that. I like that how that's set up a little better, easy for me to navigate through all of these little icons here. And notice how it kind of groups it together. Don't gotta go up and down. So I really like that. And we're gonna be going through all these things in, in subsequent lessons. On the right-hand side, you'll see again, I have my properties panel, I have my layers panel, and I have my libraries panel. Okay, that's great, fantastic. Now, I like those there, but there's other ones that I might wanna see that are not here. So how do I bring up other panels for me to work with? Up on top here, you will see I have this little menu here called the window menu, and that is essentially the factory for where all of our panels live. All right, so you'll see that there's a lot, a lot of panels for me to work with. I wanna essentially bring some of these in so I can work with them over and over and over again, right? Have easy access to them. So let's, for example, bring up the appearance panel, a very important panel in Illustrator. I want that. And then notice it comes smack there in the middle. I can just drag this from the top, move it wherever I want. That's great. Go over to here, let's go to window. Let's bring up artboard. Absolutely another very, very important one. I love that. All right, and now let's maybe bring up, uh, let's just say color and let's bring up swatches. Great. And this is just many, many, many that's available as you can see. Now, you will notice that a lot of these come with their own little sort of brothers and cousins and uncles that like, okay, swatches, like, hey, if you want me, you gotta get brushes too. You gotta get symbols too. Okay, well, 
Do I want those right now? I'm not really sure if I do. So for example, there's symbols. I don't even really know what a symbol is. Am I planning on using symbols? I don't know, maybe later on, but right now I know I don't need it. So very simply right click on the tab and choose close and that goes away. Do I need brushes right now? I don't think so. I'm gonna say close. Okay, very good. Now I'm gonna keep that as is. And now do I need something else like color guide? I'm gonna get rid of that. But I noticed that these two color and swatches should kind of be together. So very easily I can then just join these right there just by clicking and dragging, waiting for my little blue halo, and then bam, now these are one and the same, all perfect, just like that. Love that, and that makes me very happy. Now, let's see what else we can do with some of these other ones, right? So let's just say, for example, my asset export, I don't want that, so I'm going to right-click on that and say close. But notice when you right-click, you get a lot of other options, right, to close it, to close the whole tab group, like we have a tab group here that would close everything. You can minimize it. Oh, that's kind of cool. Or I can double click to then expand it out again. I can right click and I can say collapse to icons and that makes it nice and small. So it's just kind of even smaller that so it doesn't take up as much room. Okay, that's kind of neat. So I'm gonna keep that there just for future reasons. <laughs> okay, and then I'm gonna go over to here to appearance and then you'll see I have a few other options here in the upper right. You can see I can click on this, which also collapses to icons. Click on this, it brings it back, and then click on my X, and then notice that goes away. Like, oops, what happens when you accidentally, or even intentionally, remove one of your panels? Guess what? We go right back to where we started, go to window, and what was it that I let go of? Was it appearance? Yep, bam, there it is and it's back again. Okay, now let's go ahead and bring back another one. You can see here, I have a bunch of other options here I can work with. So let's just bring up, for example, info. That's a nice one. All right, have that there. All right, now let's start customizing this a little bit more. Let's say I wanna bring these guys into their own little kind of panel areas, for example. So let's just say, for example, I wanted to have swatches and colors um, on their own kind of section over here. These guys have their own section. Why can't these guys? So you'll notice that when I drag this over here into this little area, you'll notice I get this like blue halo here. Come way down to the bottom, right? I'm gonna get a blue halo down there. Come over to here, I'm gonna get another blue halo. So this is gonna give me some choices in terms of where I want to place these things potentially, okay? You'll notice if I do it with this one, I'm just gonna go and simply click and drag. I can move this over here if I want to, but because this is an icon, I want you to notice something kind of neat. If I move this right here in the center and I let go, notice how it creates a very different looking panel compared to how these are. So if I wanna have like access to all of these guys here, but smaller versions, rather than having to take up all this space, I can then just move this, wait for my little blue halo, and then bam, I can do that, I can do that, and then I can also move these guys here just the same, and you see, very nice, nice and neat. I love that. I love it so much that I wanna save this. So right now, this workspace is just called Essential Workspace. I wanna make a new workspace for myself, just say new workspace, I'm gonna call this Dave's Faves, and click OK. And now when I click on this, you will see, there it is, Dave's Faves. Now, when is that gonna come and benefit for me. How am I gonna find an advantage for this at some point? Let's say I go crazy with all this here, right? Like I move properties over here, I got layers over here, I accidentally delete libraries. Oh my God, things are just insanity. Not ex at all how I wanted things to be when I started off so idealistic in the beginning. What could I do? Very simply, I go back to where I was before over here to my workspace, and guess what? I still have Dave's Faves selected, so what I need to do is reset whatever workspace you have here. I like to think about this as the Mary Poppins effect, right, where it puts all your toys, everything in its place, everything in place for everything in place for everything in its place, or something more articulate than that. So I click on that and then watch what happens. Everything goes exactly back to where it was. Awesome, love that. Okay, now let's do one other thing. I'm gonna go over here to window. And this time I'm gonna bring up 
something called my control, my control bar. So I click on that and you'll notice that this little guy now appears way up on top that we did not have that before. So I say to myself like, okay, well, you know, I just added on something really critical and I want that to be part of Dave's faves. So what do I do? I go back over to here and then guess what I'm gonna do? I have to say new workspace and then literally type it in again exactly word for word. It's kind of like a save as, but you see a name already exists. Click OK to overwrite. You know, if you can see that, right? So you can see, all right, good. So it recognized that. That's exactly what I want. And then it overrides it. So then if I'm going to do any kind of reset or something like that, then it's going to always remember that I have this new option there as well. All right. So please pause the video and get your workspace all set up. Again, go to Essentials at first, Reset Essentials, and then try to have yours look like mine as much as possible. All right, and then when we come back, we're gonna do a little bit more overview of what's what on the screen, and then very soon you'll be illustrating in no time. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had some good luck and experience working with your new workspace, and yours looks like mine. So let's get a little deeper into what some of these panels do and how they can make our lives easier and more creative. So let's start off over here on the left hand side where we have our tools panel and you'll notice here our tools panel has a number of different individual icons that accomplish a number of different things. Right. Just think about the tools panel as like a toolbox. Each tool has its own different purpose. So if you're going to hammer something, you're going to use the hammer. But then when you're done hammering, you put it back and you grab the screwdriver. So each of these little individual icons have a different purpose and then therefore you have to change when you wanna change something else. So let's just start off over here. You'll see this is the move tool. This is our direct selection tool. Notice you a little tool tip for each of these. That's great. Some things you might recognize like the rectangle tool, right? And just all these things you can move your mouse over and you can see exactly what they do. You'll also notice that when you move your mouse over it, they all have little letters next to them. These are the keyboard shortcut that you use in order to access them. So for example, this is V. So if I literally just type V, not Control V, not Command V, notice that will access the Move tool. If I hit A, which is right next to it, that selects the Direct Selection tool. If I hit T, guess where that's gonna take me? It's gonna take me to the Type tool. So you'll wanna start to kind of memorize these things as you go along, okay, so very important. Now over here on the bottom, you're gonna see there's some other options for color. We're gonna get into those in a lot, lot more detail later on. Now, one of the more important panels that you have in Illustrator is the properties panel. Okay, so coming all the way over here, okay, this is invaluable. And this is gonna come up in so many, so many different capacities depending on what you're doing. So for an example, like I'm doing nothing right now and I have properties, of my entire document like what what's happening here really wow so this is actually telling me a whole bunch of different things what's my unit of measure right now okay that's cool okay what artboard am i working with here i can go from these three different artboards i have here we'll talk about artboards in more detail later on i can very easily add on rulers and grids just by simply clicking and then look at that my ruler now just appeared and now i'll be able to see oh you know what? I don't really want to work in these units of measure, so I can go ahead and go over here to inches. Notice how that changes. Let's change this to pixels. Okay, great, fantastic. So now I'm able to see how I can work with my properties panel on a much larger scale. And as we go through the program, as we go through more exercises, we'll be coming back to this within this perspective. Now, let's just say, for example, I'm working on this bottle. Notice when I click on the bottle, my properties panel now changes, okay? It is based on the context of what you click on, then your properties panel will they'll change based off of the context of what you've actually clicked on. Okay, now if I double click on this, you'll see I'm now inside of this bottle and you'll start to see even more stuff within this object that I can see the properties of, like the color of it, if there is a stroke, if there's any opacity, all this kind of stuff out here. I'm gonna double click in this white area again, and now I'm back to my main canvas. All right, so the properties panel is incredibly valuable. You'll also see that we have our layers panel. I have three layers here. Let me go ahead and click on my little eyeball there. Like, okay, that makes my avocado go away. 
that makes my bottle go away and this makes my pepper go away okay and we're going to again do a lot lot more on these individual ones all right as we go through um, the program we're going to be exploring all these individual panels in much larger degree okay now another thing we'll want to understand here is our um, what we called earlier our control remember this is the control we brought that in last minute in the last exercise and you're going to see the control overlaps a little bit with what we see over here in our properties panel so let me go ahead and go to my avocado i'm going to double click on that to get into my green and then notice it shows me this green fill color and it also gives me some other options for making my stroke a certain size just essentially stroke as your outline and then you can do all kinds of other things with the stroke style and blah, 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 alignment, et cetera. But notice how there's some overlap. Some people like to work with our control panel. Some people like to work with our properties panel, all right? Totally up to you. I just want you to know that both of those options are there for you, all right? Now, some other basic interface things is we wanna understand how we can zoom in and zoom out. Now, I like to use the keyboard shortcut, but I do want you to notice that way down below here, you're going to see is the option of how I'm zoomed in currently. Okay, that's great. So you can see, fantastic, I can zoom in this way to go in, let's just say 300. Like, oh man, okay, where am I now? I don't even really know. So let me just come right back to where I was before. That was a little bit disorienting. And I come right back to that. That's why I like to either use the keyboard shortcut or a combination of my mouse and keyboard shortcut. So if I use the keyboard shortcut of just controller command plus plus, that allows me and to come go in and then minus minus allows me to go out. But if you hold down the alt or option key and you have a little mouse wheel or even your trackpad, you can zoom in exactly where you want. So I'm gonna come right to the center of the avocado pit. And look how much I'm going. I'm like 200, 400, 800% in there, right? Amazing. So I have that, I'm all set up, ready to go. All right, so so use all these different you know tools that whatever you find um, you know, comfortable for you. All right now you'll also notice to the right of this right way down again on the bottom you can see here it says this says a selection what does that mean okay it means whatever kind of tool you're working with it's going to show you what tool you're in so i changed that now i'm in the selection tool direct selection tool click on that so that's kind of nice you kind of know like what am i looking at again in case you kind of forget or maybe you're working on two monitors something like that you can always look down there to see where you're at and then you'll see down here you will see all my different art boards as well. So we're going to be talking about art boards, but you can see avocado, bottle, and pepper. One, two, three. Those are my three different art boards that I'm currently working with. Just think about them as pages. But we're going to be talking about art boards in a very large degree momentarily. All right. So this will get you going for some just like basic, basic things in terms of our zooming, in terms of our moving in with our art boards, etc. I'm going to show you one last thing. As you're moving in, let me just move in real, real close. One really critical keyboard shortcut, I'm gonna go ahead and type this out for you here, is to simply just hold down the space bar and then you're going to click and drag, right? As you do that, why? That essentially allows you to pan across the canvas, right? So watch as I do that. If I hold down the space bar, notice how my hand now appears and I click and drag, still holding down to the space bar, I let go and it takes me back to the tool that I was just in. Okay, see that? Hold on the space bar, temporary access to this little hand tool, or I like to call it the pan tool. And you can see I can go ahead this way. Notice I can go in a very, very non-linear way to go wherever I want, all right? Now, the last thing I'm gonna show you is how we get out of this. How do we get out of this to go back to our basically like our main sort of best fit window? And that is going to be control plus zero. Think about that as like ground zero. Okay, if you're on the Mac, that's gonna be command plus zero. So what does that look like? Let me just try that. So control plus zero. And look at that, I'm now best fit on the current artboard that I'm in right now. Okay, so watch as I zoom in again. Controller Command Zero takes me right back. All right, so you're gonna wanna write a few of these ones down. 
um, some of these keyboard shortcuts you may have seen over here that are going to be very valuable for you. How to actually zoom in, how to zoom out, how to pan, and also how to come right back to a best fit. Because these things are going to serve you measurably as you get more and more deep into the program. And if you want to be more efficient and a little more expert, I highly, highly recommend you do that. If not now, at some point in the very near future, start to incorporate like one or two or three of these keyboard shortcuts, you know, a day and just really only do those, like really perfect it until you get it, until you feel more comfortable with it. All right, so pause the video, practice this, and we'll see you in the next exercise. Now, before we begin creating our new documents in Illustrator, let's get some things out of the way about what Illustrator is even used for and how it's different than other programs within the Adobe suite. Adobe makes a number of different kind of main programs like Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator and other ones, of course, like Premiere and After Effects. But now the ones that kind of work together for the most part, you will see are going to be Illustrator, InDesign and Photoshop. Now, Photoshop, as the name implies, works very well with photos, right? Also known as bitmap or raster images, whereas Illustrator works well with vector images and also creating vector images. Now, InDesign is a layout program and it works well with actually all three of those things, all two of those things and all three programs can kind of come together. Now, that said, there is an abundance of overlap between all three of them. Okay, more than ever, you will see that you can actually create vector images in all three programs. You can manipulate bitmap images in all three programs. Okay, so it's actually really nice that Adobe has done that for us. So we have access to be able to do that. Now, what is the difference between a bitmap and a vector, you ask? I can hear you thousands of miles away asking that same question. On the right hand side, we have what is known as a bitmap image. Okay, this is basically pixel based all right so this has millions and millions and millions of pixels but it's finite so if i were to make this super super big it would start to get a little bit grainy or pixelated as opposed to a vector image right which is if i double click on this um a little bit more of a smooth type of graphic right if i were to actually make this bigger and bigger and bigger because of the vector technology, it essentially has a mathematical program built into it that it resets itself. So therefore it does not lose any of its, of its graphic quality. All right, so when you are creating graphics inside of Illustrator, you are essentially creating them as vector graphics. Now you can bring in these bitmap images certainly and you can have them work together side by side. But when you're drawing graphics like this and this and this, you will see how nice and smooth they are. And watch how nice it is when I get really, really close up. You don't really see any pixelation. If I go over to these guys here and I come in there, you can see how it starts to get a little bit kind of grainy. You see that I'm like literally looking at what? A pixel. All of these little squares are Pixels. Pixels just a contraction for picture elements, right? That's what we're looking at here. So you can see that we're kind of just really looking at a molecular level of these images. Whereas with vector images, vector graphics, we don't have that. All right. So we're going to be learning how to create vector images from scratch using a variety of different tools. But I want to just kind of get that out of the way just so you understand what Illustrator primarily does, how it can potentially work together with the other Adobe programs, and what maybe some of the limitations you might see um, when you are working with bitmap images versus, versus vector. Now, you will see that the vector also has just like one color, three colors, or whatever it is. You have certainly like millions of colors as well, but it's not gonna get the same detail as a bitmap. So you wouldn't necessarily make a photograph out of a vector. All right. So just understanding there's pros and cons, but really you want to think about it, not really as pros and cons, but sort of like usage and application for both of them. All right. So just want to get that out of the way, digest that, and we'll see you in the next video. Let's now discuss how we create a brand new document. Now, when you're working with Illustrator, it's going to be very similar to other programs, potentially, where we're going to ask you how big you want the document to be, potentially what's the color profile, 
But it's also going to ask you things like, well, what artboard do you want to use? And uh, maybe what kind of bleed do you want? Things like that. And possibly even, you know, our units of measure, you know, that kind of thing. So we want to kind of think about these things ahead of time. And looking at my document here, you'll notice I have three artboards. And you'll also notice that here's the size of each individual one by pixels, right? You can see this, my unit of measure is measured in pixels, etc. So what we wanna do now is create our own new document, knowing what we know now, and let's just see what that dialog box looks like. So many times when you just start Illustrator, it's gonna come up, give me the option to do a new document. We're gonna do it directly from this interface by going to file and new, but also notice the keyboard shortcut big fan of keyboard shortcuts. So you'll hear me talk about that a lot. Control N or Command N takes you now to something that might potentially look like this. Now, I want you to just not get distracted by anything down below. I want you to get distracted by this. You can see here, I have a number of different tabs here, saved, mobile, web, etc. And they're giving me some nice little sort of presets. So if I go over here to mobile, you'll see there's some nice little presets based off of the different phone sizes. And you'll also see the different units of measure there. I go to web, different kind of presets, right? So maybe I'm doing a mock-up for a website. Great, it's all set up for me, ready to go. Go to print. Notice how it's a different unit of measure this time. It's in points, okay? And then film and video, art and illustration, etc. You'll also notice that Illustrator is very generous enough to give you a whole bunch of different templates to work with. So definitely check those out if you're feeling comfortable with that. All right, now you'll also see here is saved. So you may actually have some that you've been saving so you can use them over and over and over again. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new one and then we're going to go ahead and actually save it. So I don't have to actually create it all, all over again. So I'm going to go over to here, just choose print. And again, here are my presets. I'm going to go over to this side and now make my custom changes on all these different things here that I have available to me. So for example, I want to make this in inches. Notice how it now changes. That's great. And I want to change the orientation from portrait to landscape. That's great. Love that. And then here is the thing I was talking about before is working with artboards. Okay. How many artboards do you want? Okay. So for right now, I'm just going to say two, so as you can see how you do it. We're going to have a whole discussion on artboards in a little bit. All right, then we also have our bleed. Okay, so you might have something that looks like, let me come down to one of these templates, like this right here, how you want it to bleed off the edge here. So if you're gonna do that, you typically are not gonna say zero. You do wanna go a little more than zero, so it goes off the edge. So when you are printing it, you don't accidentally get a little sort of like white sliver there or whatever the color of the paper is. Okay, so just keeping that in mind. Then you also want to think about your color mode. All right. Notice here I have just two choices. RGB is if you're going to be doing something on the web or print if it's going to be on a screen. And then CMYK is for when you're going to be printing it. Okay. Because on the screen, our screen, the screen that you're looking at right now is broken up is as red, green, blue. That's like the magic that it's doing from the screen and the magic that the printer itself is doing is through cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Maybe some of you have changed your printer uh, cartridges before, and you say, why is this weird colors I've never used before? Wow, interesting. So that's how it's made up, okay? Now it's very important to establish this ahead of time. What is gonna be the goal for your, uh, for your project? Is it gonna be printed or is it gonna be on the web? And then you're gonna wanna choose your color profile accordingly, all right? And then also notice here is raster effects. That's the word we just used earlier um, with our um, with with when we talked about you know Illustrator vector versus raster objects or bitmap. So you want to decide how high quality is that going to be for for vector. It doesn't really matter, but essentially how high quality it's going to be. And typically this is going to be for print. You want to be pretty high like this. And if it's going to be for screen, notice here seventy two PPI. So really up to you you'll know what your projects are. All right, now I'm just gonna go ahead and click on create. And now you see here, I have two artboards all ready to go. You can see it's set up in inches. I love that, that's great. And then guess what? I can do all kinds of other things here. Like I can turn my ruler on here. I can turn my grids on, okay? I can do all kinds of really, really good stuff here. 
All right, so that's just the basics of creating something in a little bit. We're gonna learn how we can actually create something, but also learn some basic selection techniques. We have a lot more to go. Just wanna get this out of the way so everybody's super comfortable with how to even get started. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, before we actually start creating some things, let's get some of the basics out of the way. And one of the most basic fundamental skills you're gonna have in Illustrator is selection. And I know it sounds very, very rudimentary, but it is very important because in order to affect it, you have to select it. So we really wanna understand that when you want to manipulate something, edit something, it has to be selected. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different ways to select things. And there's some other little, nice little chips and tools that we're gonna be getting into as well in terms of selection that's kind of more than meets the eye. So let's see what our basic selection tools are here. You can see here is my regular selection tool. This is my direct selection tool. And again, if you go between the V and the T, they just switch up. Okay, so you can go ahead and switch these back and forth by the mouse or not. Okay, or you can use your keyboard shortcut. It just appears right there with the tool tip. Now, you will also notice that as I change, you will notice also my properties panel changes. Now, just again, keeping that in mind, understanding how the properties panel works. Now, I haven't even selected anything, and we haven't even talked about what's the difference between these two. Now, this regular selection tool will select an entire object, right? Pretty much like what you expect a selection tool to do in any other program you've worked with. That's essentially what selection does. And that's gonna allow me to now just simply click and drag, move it around. It's also gonna allow me to resize it. So if I hold down the shift key while dragging on the corners here, I can then resize it. Why did I hold down the shift key? Because I wanted to constrain the proportions, right? Just like that. See that if I don't, then it gets all wide Maybe I want that, but again, up to you. And I'm just gonna do Command or Control Z to undo, or just go to Edit and undo. Okay, so very basic to be able to do that. Now, I also might want to rotate. So I'm still in the same tool. Now, watch what happens now when I move my mouse to the corner here. Notice I get this kind of little button hook. If I click and drag now, I can now change the direction and rotate this little shape. Okay, so it's kind of kind of squiggly to get there. Now, another nice little tool is if you hold down the shift key as you're doing this, watch what happens is it locks in place like every 45 degrees, right? And that's pretty cool. So if I know I want it to be exactly like that, I can do that or let's go 90 degrees, cool. All right, so that's holding down the shift key as I am rotating. All right, so pretty neat. Now let's take a look at some of our other options here. This is your direct selection tool. And this is gonna be one that you'll be using just as much if not more than our regular selection tool. Because we are working with these vector images. All of these are vector images. All of these are individual you know, shapes, you might hear them called. And if you are working with the regular selection tool, you can't manipulate these individual parts of it to really get a custom shape but you can with the direct selection tool. So watch what happens now when I choose this right here. I get, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, I get these like individual little path points, right? These individual path points, or maybe you hear them called vector points. Let's go to this one. This one has a lot of path points. Wow, let's go to this one. Okay, just a handful here. So notice whenever there's kind of a curve or whatever, that's where you're gonna see these little path points. You'll see here, if I move my mouse over it, see it kind of lights up a little bit. That's great. All right, cool. So that's how we can select our individual shapes. We're gonna get into in a little bit how we can work a little bit more fluidly with our direct selection tool. At this point, you kind of want to get that out of the way. Now, if you right click on this, you'll see there's a few other options here. Like you have a group selection. Things could be grouped. So you can then just go ahead and it just works on the whole group right there. So bam that's gonna kind of overlap between this. In future exercises, we're gonna see how this is really gonna help us. Then you also have the lasso tool. This is another selection to be able to do, right? So if I choose this now, watch what happens when I just kind of like lasso through. I'm just gonna basically just touch this. Notice how that's now selected, okay? But I want you to notice that what isn't selected is this part down here, okay? So you'll notice 
that there is this little area right there that's hollow where this area is filled, right? Essentially telling me that this is selected, this is not. So let's just do that again, but this time I'm gonna lasso over the entire thing and now everything is now filled, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind that the lasso tool can be really helpful, but many times if you accidentally don't select or you don't touch a certain part of it, if you don't go like through where those anchor points are, then you may not actually be selecting what you think. But notice how I don't even really have to touch anything. As soon as I now close up my loop, everything now gets selected. If I would just hit delete right now, everything then gets deleted. I'm just gonna undo that and then come right back there. All right, so those are your nice little basic selection techniques. All right, and we're gonna come back, we're gonna do a few more, but just practice that and we'll come back in the next lesson. Let's now discuss another tool called the magic wand tool, which is gonna help us with a different type of selection that's gonna make things potentially a little more efficient for us. So in this document, we have a lot of different colors and a lot of different strokes. And sometimes we want to just select sort of like things, like similar things that are on the page here for us. So if I want to choose like all my blue right now and all the shapes that are blue, I have to like oh, go over to here. I remember we learned about the, the lasso tool and I can just kind of just go through, oh, man, that, that is a big pain. I got to go through all that. I guess, you know, you can also use the, the shift tool. I heard about that. You can hold on the shift key. You can do that. All right, and that, that or maybe even the, the command or control, does that work? You know, it's not really as good as I'd like it to be. So what we're gonna learn about is this guy here, the magic wand tool, the magic wand tool. So before we even do it, before we even execute what it can do, we're gonna learn about something within Illustrator that's gonna be very important to do for all these tools, which simply that you can double click on one of these icons to then see all of these options that are hiding there. A lot of other Adobe programs don't have that ability. When you double click on a lot of these icons, you actually get a whole bunch of options that pop up that are reflective of that tool. So the magic wand tool is gonna to allow me to select similar things, but I have to choose what am I actually choosing? In this case, notice fill color is chosen. So when I choose the magic wand tool and I choose this fill color, guess what? Every shape that has that blue fill color will then get chosen. Isn't that amazing? So cool, let's do this now. I'm gonna choose just stroke color and let's just choose all the ones that have white. So I just simply click and look at that. All of the white shapes get chosen. It's the coolest thing. Maybe it's all the ones that have stroke weight, etc. Now, why is this important? Because let's say I my, my a client comes in and says, hey, Dave, um, we're not doing white strokes anymore. You know, that's so 2020. We're not doing that anymore. So let's just change it to black. Oh, cool. Now I can do that for every single one of them because every single one of them is chosen. Same thing for fill color. All right. And then, you know, some of these other maybe potentially more complex ones that you're working with in terms of stroke weight, opacity and blend mode. All right. We're going to be getting into those in subsequent lessons, but I want you to understand how amazing the magic wand tool is for doing selections. Okay, so now that I see that all these are selected, let's just say I hit delete, they're all gone. Okay, so you have to select it to affect it. That's the way that I wanted to affect it, right? So very, very cool. All right, so again, we learned that you can double click on one of these icons to get more options, and then we actually executed it based off of what we chose, and then we did whatever we wanted to do to affect it. So go ahead and pause the video, practice that maybe with some other tools that you have available, other projects you're working on, or certainly use this one. Okay, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, well, ready or not, we are now going to learn how to do some basic illustration. And we're going to start off just by using some of the shape tools that Illustrator gives us. All right, so you will see on the left-hand side where our tools are, we have this little box right there, and you'll notice that tiny little triangle right there, which is indicating to me that when I right click, I have a whole bunch of options here to draw out in terms of what shapes I wanna work with. Now you'll also notice that Illustrator gives this nice little, little arrow here that's gonna allow us to do, guess what? 
click on that and then tear that tool away. So therefore, I don't have to keep going back here to then go ahead and draw out what shapes I want. Okay, so I don't have to actually keep going here and then oh, I want to choose a polygon this time. I can just go right to here and work with that. All right, now let's start drawing out some shapes. So if I just simply click on that right now, I'm going to draw out a rectangle. Now you will see, I'm going to just click and drag here and then I have a white rectangle. Okay, that's great. Now, why did that come out white? Let me go ahead and delete that. Let's discuss what's actually happening before I even like start going crazy with all this and waste my time. This is coming in white because if you notice here, I have a white box right there. And you also notice I have a white box right there telling me essentially what the fill color is going to be. So do you want that to be the fill color? Maybe not. You'll also notice that there's another option here which is telling me what my stroke color is going to be. What is the stroke? Stroke is essentially just the outline, just the outline of that shape. So I don't like to do white in this case because white is going to be on top of white. So I'm not going to choose white. I want to choose a different color. So I'm going to simply just double click on this and then it pops right up to my color picker. And you'll notice here I can choose from any number of color hues over here on the left hand side. And on the left hand side, I'm going to choose my different shading of that set of hues. Okay, we're going to get into more detail on colors, but just while we're here, let's just understand how we can work with this. Here is all of our different hues, and then here is going to be the shading. And then you can also change all of the little brightness options of what that's going to be. Now you'll also notice that there's going to be these options over here on the right hand side for is it going to be RGB and or is it going to be CMYK or is it going to be our hexadecimal values? Now, you will need to know what those things are. Your design team or whoever is going to tell you what that's going to be. And you're going to say, hey, what's the CMYK value? And they'll give you those four numbers. Hey, what's the RGB value? And they'll give you those three numbers or they're going to give you the hexadecimal number and you will put that in. OK, so totally up to you. But I want you to just notice here how that changes on all levels for all of these. OK, so let's just choose this nice, pretty purple color. I'm going to click OK. Now notice what's going to happen. I'm going to have a purple fill and a black stroke. And I'm just going to simply hold down the shift key so I can have a perfect square. Great. Wonderful. OK. Love that. Now, one thing to understand is that if I click right now, notice what pops right up. Right? And that's the thing that's going to make you go nuts. Like, like oh, oh, it's asking me to draw a rectangle. I don't want to do that. So what I want to do is just either come back to my move tool. You notice here is selection, right? And that's going to kind of give me sort of like a neutral place to be. And you'll also notice that under select, there's the option to deselect if you want to. And notice the keyboard shortcut. And that's the same thing. So essentially it takes you to kind of like a nice neutral place as you're doing this. All right. So therefore you don't accidentally keep getting that dialog box to pop up. I guarantee you it's going to happen like a million times to all of you <laughs> out of the first like, you know, week or two. All right. Now let's try a different one. Right click. Actually, I don't even need to do that because guess what? This is sitting here waiting for me. Fantastic. And this time I'm going to choose a different color. Look OK and hold down the shift key and beautiful. Wonderful. Fantastic. I can move this however I want. I can resize it coming from the corners. That's great. Lovely. So cool. Let's check out some other things here. Let's go over here to the polygon tool and then watch what happens now when I just click and drag. It's going to give me kind of like a, well, is that what I want? I don't know. Is that how many sides I want? So maybe, I don't know. So let me actually delete that. Let's see what we can do now to get different sides. Watch what happens now when I click and drag and I start tapping on my keyboard where you find the arrow keys. It's going to allow me to add or subtract sizes of the variety of different polygons I can work with. OK, let me do that one more time so you can see that in action. Click and drag and then watch this. Up arrow is four, five, six, seven, eight down, 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 all the way back to three. So as I'm clicking and dragging, I'm just tapping on the keyboard. You see that? Just tapping on my arrow keys. OK, so that's great. Love that. And here we are. OK, so 
Nice, nice little set of features there for us to work with in a really cool way as you're clicking and dragging on this. All right, now, if you do have the polygon tool and you don't like to use that, you could then just simply click and it's gonna ask you, hey, how many sides do you want? And I could say, okay, you know what? I want eight sides, nine sides, okay? I click okay, and then it just draws it out for me. So you have all those options, however you wanna do it. I like the first way, because I think it's pretty slick and I can see it on the fly, but again, up to you. Now, you'll also see here that if I wanted to change the color, like I don't want all of them to be the same color, so if I wanna change my triangle to be a different color, I can then go back to here and then choose a different color, different hue, different shading. Okay, that's great. And you'll also notice that I could choose from here as well. Notice this one takes me to what's called my swatches, which we're gonna get to in a little bit, but these are all basically just like saved colors, all right? I click on, let's say that one, great, fantastic. And also you'll notice one more option here is in my appearance panel, which you should all have up right now. And you'll see, it's another way of get to your, getting to your swatches panel. Just make that orange. You can see how easy that is. All right, now the last thing we're gonna talk about in our shapes is this beautiful star menu. All right, so this time I'm gonna access the star menu from here, so you can see what that does. And guess what? I can click and drag on the star, and while I'm doing that, I'm gonna hit plus, plus, plus. How cool is that to then have the first bit of my Lisa Simpson haircut. All right, that's awesome, fantastic. Of course, I can rotate this, resize it, and do whatever I wanna do with that, okay? Now, the star is slightly interesting because I might not want my star to look exactly like this. I know how many sides I want, but there's something called the radius that I can play around with. So when I choose this, and then I do my alternative by just simply clicking, you're gonna notice then I now have a bunch of different options here for my different radii, okay? So I have my nine points, but let's just go ahead and just make this go maybe about 10 inches. All right, I'm gonna click okay. And now, whoa, look what that did, okay? That's my radius going outward just like that. Let's do another one. All right, let's bring that back down to three. And then this one, let's make that five inches. Okay, and you can see, oh, okay. And that's the radii going in from the center. Okay, so we're gonna learn how we can customize each individual point if you want to, right? If you wanna kind of really customize this. But I just want you to see how you can really kind of go crazy with the different stars, right? So you don't just, just keep the ones that they give you. You can, again, play around with the different radii and explore what's gonna be best for you. All right, and let me just bring this over to here so it's not sharing the artboard with the other one. Let's just show you one more because this might be coming up, which is the line, and line's pretty simple. Let me just go ahead and just hold in the shift key. That gives me a perfectly straight line, and I can change the color of that, which is a stroke, and I can also change the width and do all that stuff. So now that we understand also a little bit how the line works, how you can actually use this because this is essentially is a stroke, you should understand that these all have strokes on them too. You can barely see them. You can't really see the color, but each of them has strokes on them. And later on, we're gonna get into much more detail on it, but I want you to notice in case you missed it, that there are some strokes here. So if you go over here in the upper, upper left, you'll see here's the option to change your stroke. You'll also notice over here on the far right in my appearance and properties panel, you'll see here it is to be able to change the width of our strokes. So let's just do that again for my circle and I'll do it this time. I'll bring this up, up, up. And this time I'm gonna change the color of my stroke to something very different. Let's make that yellow and click okay and pretty cool. Now I'm able to see, oh, okay, cool. I can manipulate shapes in a variety of different ways. I can draw my shapes. I can choose my fill color. I can choose my stroke. Then I can manipulate it afterwards. And then I can manipulate the stroke width and the stroke color. All right, so we learned about how to draw a number of different shapes. Now, why is this important for when you're working in Illustrator? For many people, working with shapes is the building block for just basically creating 
your characters, right? It could be an icon. It could be so many, so many different things like looking at our avocado. Like this started off as a circle and our pit started off as a circle. And you see, we just kind of built around that. And notice how there is this label as a square. This bottle started off as a certain way. And we're gonna learn how we can do some of these things, even make rounded corners and do all kinds of other things in just a little bit. So these are the basics of our shapes. Pause the video, practice up, and we'll see you in the next lesson. So as we've seen so far, shapes are definitely, definitely a necessary part of your design, of any kind of project you're working on, documents, big or small, just for a variety of different reasons, just to maybe frame things uh, for visual interest, for decoration, whatever it is, okay? Now, drawing out your shapes, there is more nuance than just simply clicking and dragging. And Illustrator gives you a lot of pretty neat shortcuts to be able to accomplish a variety of different goals. And they're a little bit hidden, as are a lot of the shapes that we have access to. So we can see here, of course, we have all of our basic shapes, and we also have some other ones, right, that you may not have noticed before, like our spiral tool, our grid tool, our polar grid tool. So let's now discuss some of these little nuances. So for example, let's say I want to draw out a perfect circle going concentrically from the middle. So I'm gonna go over to here to my ellipse tool and I want to draw this out concentrically from the center of this circle of this shape. So we're gonna add on another modifier which is the alter option key while holding down the shift key. So I'm gonna move my mouse right here to the center and then I'm just going to hold down the alt option key and then bam, look at that. See how it grows out from the center. I let go and you can see, perfect. Okay, and of course I'd want to fill that in so I can really see it. Okay, lovely, amazing. Okay, we're gonna learn how to work with guides and grids and stuff um, in future lessons to really make that where we start off in a perfect place. But for right now, just understand that's pretty neat. Let me do that one more time and I'm gonna just this time do it with a square. And what am I doing? Again, it's a perfect square because I'm holding on the shift key and it grows out from the center because I'm holding on the alt or option key. Okay, so I'll do that again, bam. Bam, and let's just see, watch it grow. Amazing, love that, that is so cool. All right, now let's go ahead and explore some other features. So let's go over here to my star tool. Watch what happens now when I click and drag out from here, and then notice how I'm getting a certain number of spikes. So watch what happens when I hit the up arrow. Whoa, that's so cool. The down arrow, very cool, right? So what are you trying to get? So the arrow key is allowing me to now manipulate how many spikes I'm getting on my star, right? Really, really easy to do, but incredibly valuable for being efficient and also being a little more creative, okay? So try those little nuances, okay? So in that same vein, using our keyboard shortcuts, our up, down, and arrows, let's go ahead and just explore some other ones here. Like the spiral tool, relatively basic, right? So watch what happens now as I click and drag, actually before I do that, let's make sure that I have some kind of thing to work with. Let's make this a little bit bigger. I'm gonna make it so it has no spill right there. Thank you very much. Okay, now if I click and drag now, notice I can just click and drag to get my spiral in such a certain way. But now if I hit the up arrow, see that? I can actually make it much, much more spirally. Okay, and I can make it go further out like that or come in like that, whatever you're trying to do, pretty neat. And there you go. Okay, and then of course you can play around with brush strokes on this. You can play around with your strokes in general. You can do all kinds of different things we're gonna learn about in future lessons. But you'll see how neat that is with some modifiers. Let's try some other ones. Let's go over here to our rectangular grid tool. Really good for organizing your content in a very structured way. But as the name implies, it's gonna create sort of like a table, if you will. But how does it create a certain number of rows and columns is really up to us. If I click and drag now, notice what I'm doing here. With my keyboard, I'm gonna go up, up, up. And what is that doing? Adding on more rows, taking away rows. Go to the right, adding on more columns. Okay, so wow, pretty cool, pretty quickly and easily. And you can see, very nice. Now I can just structure my content however I please that way. All right, and then let's now just talk about the polar grid.
and that is going to be right underneath here and then this one is a little more kind of detailed if you will but still pretty cool nonetheless okay so let me go ahead and draw out my polar grid and you'll see as i go up 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 see that how it adds on kind of more sort of latitude lines i go down 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 just like that or look at my little pie segments now more or less see that so what are you trying to create and now i can kind of make it just very simple to do whatever i like okay so you have all the creativity in the world to be able to do something very very detailed okay and then of course i can fill this in maybe i'm going to add on a stroke maybe a thicker stroke and you can see how it sees every single one of these lines and the shape and everything like that as one unit okay so it's pretty extraordinary like how we can execute something so complex so easily all right so you want to practice all these right so just know that there's a lot of tips and tricks sort of under the hood by adding on little modifiers like our alt key or option key on the mac our shift key but then also try to put it out there where you're going to then use the up arrow key and the down arrow key just to explore and see what happens all right, but then the last thing I want you to do, and again, this is gonna be just sort of like a cultural thing, if you will, is always remember just to double click on an icon within Illustrator to see what options sort of like live underneath there that may give you um, more options than you realize and also help you execute a little faster. So for example, if I go ahead and double click on the polar grid here, you'll see, oh, this is giving me a number of different options. If you know exactly how many concentric dividers you want, how many radial dividers you want, you can play around with that here however you want. If you wanna fill in the grid, right, yes or no. So you wanna play around with all of these because many of these options, including our, our rectangular grid and we saw from our star earlier, they all have other options kind of like living underneath there. Okay, so highly, highly encourage you to experiment, have fun, and we'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to discuss the direct selection tool in a little bit more detail and just see what it can do for us um, in terms of just being able to manipulate our shapes in a little more kind of like nuanced way. Right? We've discussed a little bit about how we comparing our regular selection tool and our direct selection tool. Now let's really see it in action. So we have this nice little beautiful shape here. And I'm just going to simply click on my shape and you'll notice here. OK, great. These little anchor points now appear. See that anchor point, anchor point. There's another anchor point there. OK, that's great. Now, what do they do for us? I want you to notice that when I click on this little anchor point right here, I'm going to get these little handles that appear here. Click on that one. Handles that appear here. Click on this one. No handles. Huh? Interesting, how about this one? Hmm, what about this one way down below? No handles. What is the difference between all these ones that I've just selected? One is a curve and one is not, right? It's just a corner. So Illustrator will treat each of these a little bit differently depending on the type of line or the type of shape that it in fact is. So let's go with something very easy and obvious to work with. Here is a very, very obvious, just little corner that I can work with, right? So if I wanted to now manipulate this and just that point right there, if I click on this, I want you to notice how this becomes dark blue, just like that, do you see that? That is now showing me that that point is now selected. And because I have the direct selection tool chosen, I can now manipulate this, right? So I click and drag and then, wow, look at that. How cool, let's try this one. I'm just gonna marquee over that, sometimes that's easier. And then bam, I can make this go crazy just like that. Awesome, fantastic. I love that, so cool, just kind of treat it like taffy. Now, you'll notice that the one down here, right below it, is not a corner, so it has a little curve. So therefore, when I click on it, I'm gonna get these little handles here. Okay, so again, taking a look at these little handles here, you will see that 
they're going to give us some power over these individual curves. These handles are known as Bezier handles, and they're going to allow you to control the direction and the magnitude and the degree of the curve as you click on these, right? So if I click and drag on this little guy right here, you'll notice how my curve can go out like that or in like this if you want to. Pretty cool. Come into here, and this time I'm actually going to bring this inward. I'm not just going to click and drag in a circle. I'm just actually going to bring it in so it's a little shorter. So that actually affects how my curve goes, right? So you'll notice that as I'm moving in, my curve then reflects that, right? You see that? How my curve now reflects that. Now it does it on both sides. We're going to explore how we can kind of manipulate that a little bit more. But at this point, it's really about controlling how these guys work as you move them around. So let's just now do another one. Let's come over here to our heart and let's just see one more where I'm just going to drag this up or drag this back up. Okay. And you'll see also how these lines, how they compare with each other makes this more symmetrical. Now, these guys also have something in the middle and the one you see the one in the middle, the little path point, it's very similar to how it works when you're working with just a regular corner is that it's a lot more intuitive where you can just kind of move it up and down. Okay. But it stays with the curve and then you can also make it more concave or more convex. However you want to do that. You can go to the left, you can go to the right. Okay. You have all that kind of control to manipulate the shape. And because this is a vector shape, guess what? It doesn't get pixelated at all. So I can make this just go totally crazy. Go, excuse me, go in this direction and just drag that. Sorry. Just make sure you have the actual anchor point chosen and just click and drag outwards like that. Great. And now I can just go nuts. All right. So this is a nice basic overview of how we work with the uh, direct selection tool. Now, if we come back to our shapes here, maybe something a little bit easier to work with. Let me go over to my star. And let's say I want to manipulate this little point to go up. Very simply, select that. Come over to here, select that. Come over to here. Maybe I want to make this come inward. Come in like that. Okay, that's great. Okay, have this come in again, select it, make sure it is solid blue. And make this go out. And I'm really starting to kind of come together. Maybe this is going to go in like this. So you can really just start to customize this however you like, but it's really important that you are selecting your individual anchor point using the direct selection tool to then be able to manipulate it accordingly, however you like. Now that we're only now working with what? With our, our corner points. But let's say, for example, I'm working with this shape right here and I want to manipulate this to like start making a face. So I click on that. All I got to do now is click and drag this down and there I am. Okay. So now I've got an alien, right? Or maybe I got a guitar pick, you know? So it's just like, okay, it started off as a circle and now it's something completely different. Okay. And these shapes are obviously very basic and the shapes that we were working with here, relatively basic. And we come over here to these, you'll see that sometimes you're going to be a little bit more complex. So if I go back to my direct selection tool, I choose this and you say, okay, wow, there's a lot of anchor points here, you know, so I might want to manipulate these in such a way. And I have the option to, because I have all these little individual anchor points to work with. All right. So as we start moving forward and start drawing things out in a more complex way, we're going to learn about how anchor points really work for us, how we can add anchor points, how we can remove anchor points, etc. Okay, at this point, I really want you to just understand how we can work with the selection tool to be able to manipulate it. Then once we start drawing it out, then you're going to use a combination of shapes, our direct selection tool, and guess what? The pen tool and the pencil tool. All right, so pause the video, practice this, get incredibly comfortable with the direct selection tool because it is something you're going to be using a lot, a lot, a lot. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how we can work with scaling in maybe a little bit more sort of precise way. 
All right, so you've probably already seen how I can just select an object and I can scale this, right? So if I just hold down my shift key and click and drag from the corners, great, I can do that. Fantastic, I can do that same thing and notice how they're all individual layers. I can select them and my bounding box comes up. Wonderful. Now you do have some other scaling tools that you can work with. So if I right click over here, you're gonna see that there is rotate, scale, reflect, etc. We're just gonna work with scale for right now. Notice the keyboard shortcut is simply just S. So that's pretty cool, so I'm just right there. So if I just hit V, it takes me back to my move tool. If I hit S, that takes me right to my scaling tool. Now what's nice about this is that I could be anywhere on the screen here, and then watch what happens when I hold down my shift key and just click and drag. I don't actually have to like touch it. I'm just like automatically inside there, okay? It's great. Actually, I'm not holding on the shift key in this case, right? Because it's automatically set to do that. And bam, there you are. I can go ahead and resize this however I want, not even touching the graphic. Pretty cool. Let's now do this guy here. And this time, so I don't leave the scale tool, I just held down the control key for a split second or the command key on the Mac to be able to activate this. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, right? Because now I'll look at this, I'm back in my scale tool without having to do anything at all. And then I'm going to now just click and drag and then he is now bigger, he is now smaller. Do that, bam, bam, just like that. Let's do the same thing with this one. Hold down the command or control key to then release selection of this and then simply click on a new object. And now I can just do my thing, clicking and dragging just like that, okay? So pretty cool, now I've created kind of some scale and some vantage points, okay, some perspective. This guy looks like he's way in the back. All right, very nice. All right, so that's kind of your basics of scaling. I mean, it's really, really kind of easy to work with, right? And then it's an easy one to remember as far as your keyboard shortcuts. Now, you will also see, like we've seen in some of the other tools, including the eyedropper and the magic wand, is that if you double click on this, you're gonna get a whole bunch of options here in case you wanted to work with these, right? So if you wanted to actually know your exact amount that you're going to actually like make it bigger, this is 135% bigger than it was before, or maybe that your vertical and your horizontal are gonna be a bit different, you can do that. If things are not coming in the way that you want to, and in terms of your scale and your strokes, you can say, hey, don't scale in this way or do scale in this way. Because sometimes if you got scales, those are gonna get, excuse me, sometimes if you have strokes, those are gonna get too big. But you still want it to be as one. You can say, hey, don't do that. So therefore you'll be fine, okay? So therefore you won't lose that. And then you can always preview it based off of what you have here, okay? Based off of what you've chosen. Now there's another really cool thing, and we get into this a little bit more in my advanced class, is the ability to copy. So maybe you don't want to make any changes to this particular one, but you want a copy of this. Pretty neat that you can do this. So if I just say uniform, and this time this is gonna be, let's just say 80%, and then I say copy, notice what that does. I now have a new one that's separated out from my other guy there. Okay, so pretty cool. So it's not just a basic scaling thing. It gives me the option to, guess what? I can duplicate it and also resize it all the same. Okay, so a lot more nuance than you might realize. So remember, use the scale tool, use your keyboard shortcuts, and then go where you need to go accordingly um, as far as resizing it, and then double click on it to go a little bit deeper if you like. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now we just talked about the scaling tool. Within this same little family is also the rotate tool. And we've seen how we can rotate very easily just by simply clicking on it. And I can come to my corners here and I can rotate this, no problem. So maybe that's all you like, okay, that's great. But now let's go ahead and see if we can do it in a slightly different way. I right click on this, notice here is the rotate tool. Notice also the letter R if I wanna activate that. So again, if I just hit R, that will switch over to rotate and I can be anywhere I want right on here, I don't have to touch it, right? I can just be right over here and then now, look at that, upside down donkey. All right, go that way, all right, great, wonderful, fantastic. Let me go ahead and do the same thing with this little guy here, hold down the control key to deselect this, at the same time, select this one, then at the same time, still stay in my rotate tool and then bam, there I go. All right, so love that, that's pretty cool. But let's say 
I don't want it to rotate exactly how it's been rotating. Like, as you notice here, it's rotating right from that center sort of fulcrum, right? So I don't necessarily want that. Okay, so I might wanna do it a little bit of a different way. So what I'm gonna do is hold down the Option or Alt key and just simply click in the corner of where I want it to be. And two things happen. Number one, that little center point of where it's gonna rotate around then moves over here. And then it gives me the option to now even rotate it if I want to be able to see what that's going to do. Okay, it's pretty cool. So maybe I want his feet to always remain the same right where they are, if I wanna do that. All right, and then also notice here I can copy it, right? So then if I can have like several of these. In a future lesson in my advanced class, we're gonna learn how to build a mandala um, or a flower or whatever you want it to be. And we're gonna learn how we can actually rotate and copy at the same time. So it's pretty neat. So let me cancel this. And you'll notice that my little fulcrum there is still there and I can still do that manually. I don't need to actually have that dialog box up. And now, bam, there it is and his feet remain the same. Okay, so again, a lot more than meets the eye when you go into your rotate tool and also your scale tool. And of course, if you double click, same thing as what we just saw earlier, it pops right up. Okay, so that double clicking is kind of unusual within um, Illustrator that you don't see it in other programs. So you wanna just kind of experiment, just say, hey, what would happen if I double clicked here? What would happen if I double click? And then bam, you'll be very surprised pleasantly to see all the options you have there. All right, pause the video, practice that either on this document or anything else that you have available. Okay, see you in the next lesson. In the next few lessons, we're gonna learn how to draw this avocado. But now before we start getting our hands dirty with that, let's have a nice little overview of how we work with layers to help us better organize our content. Now, if you don't have the layers panel up already, go over here to window and then bring up layers. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring layers out here so we can all see it together. And this particular document has one, two, three main layers because I have my three little artboards there. All right, we'll talk more about artboards in a little bit, but I want you to see, okay, that's very good. So I have these here. Now, if I click on this little flyout menu here, it's gonna open this up to what the content is of that particular layer. Now, this is just known as layer four. Now understand how Illustrator works is that when you start creating new things in a particular layer, it just creates new content within that layer. Essentially like little sub layers get automatically created. So many people, when they create something, they never actually add on an additional official layer, what Illustrator calls a layer, but new content that gets generated. So for many of you, you may only be looking at things that just have like one layer just like this and you have a lot of stuff inside of it okay and it's still called layer one but there's a lot of content inside of there okay up to you how you want to organize things i like to be nice and structured with things i want to name these i also want to maybe group them potentially and you want to separate things out that might be type you know maybe bitmaps maybe your logo images whatever it's going to be you're going to give it some some context and some structure so what i'm going to do is I'm going to rename this by double clicking on it. And I'm just going to say avocado. All right. Very good. Fantastic. And then I have a nice little grouping here. Okay. Everything is grouped together as one. And by the way, grouping is pretty easy. I'll just kind of give you a nice little quick overview of grouping while we're here. Let's say I want to group these together. I'm just going to go ahead and just hold down my shift key, select this. And if you just right click on it, you'll see I can group these together and then therefore these are now grouped. You can also just simply select two items and then just do command or control G on your keyboard. Okay, so G for group. All right, so just a little sidebar there. All right, and then they will become grouped in your layers panel as well. All right, now I want you to understand about when you're working with layers, I want you to notice this little area right there, okay? That's telling me what in fact is selected. You may think that something is selected just by virtue of you clicking on the actual layer itself, but in fact, this is not selected. But when I click on this little guy right there, notice this gets selected. See how I have this little circle there? That will actually select 
the objects on that layer. So watch what happens. Again, I click on the avocado. Is that selected? No, it looks like it is. But when I click on the circle, watch this. See that all the content gets selected in that layer itself or whatever we have going on there. Notice how that's all selected. Okay, it's all group, so that makes it easier. All right, so just understand that because that can be a little bit confusing for folks. All right, so notice also how they all have different colors associated with them. So if I go over here and I double click on this next to where it says avocado, this is gonna give me a whole bunch of layer options. Okay, you'll see how this is a nice pretty color blue. This is also blue, my bounding box, because that is in fact my layering color. So it tells me the bounding box is the same color as this layer. Cool. So I know what I've just selected. All right. And of course you can change these to lots and lots of other colors. All right. Of course you can change the name of it as well. Down below, you're going to have a whole bunch of options here that you can now control of, okay, this is the layer I just created. Is this going to be a template layer? Oh my God, look what happens when I make something a template layer. It actually makes it so the image becomes dimmed. It becomes locked. It is showed. It is preview, but it's not going to be printed. Oh, let me just unclick that. And then, okay, that's pretty cool because it's going to automatically do a whole bunch of things. When would I make something into a template layer? Let's say I want to trace this, you know, which we're going to do in a little bit. And I want to be able to say, hey, listen, let's make this look exactly like what's underneath here because it's a bitmap image. I got it from someplace else. Maybe you drew it yourself and you want to be able to trace it and then make it vector. You can easily do that by making something a template and then that will dim it to whatever. So it's kind of hiding in the background. Then you have all these other options here in terms of do you want to show it? Do you want it to be previewed right inside of the layer itself? Do you want it to be locked? And when you do print it, do you want it to be printed? Okay. So just know what your options here. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to keep it as it was before. So I want you to notice that within my layers panel, I have the option to actually turn off the visibility. That's essentially the same thing as when you said show, and that's going to make it disappear just because maybe it's getting in the way. I just want it to go away. This is going to guess what? Lock it. If I wanted to lock it right here from within the layers panel, I can do that. And then when I try to click it, can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Now when I unlock it, now, absolutely, I can do that, all right? So you might want to do that with other things, again, that are competing with whatever objects you are working with, all right? Now, you'll also notice that here's another option down below that you may want to create a new layer altogether for yourself, right? So I'm going to create one just called type. So I click on that, and now I double click on this. I'm just going to say type. That's great. And then I double click again to change the color because I don't want it to be any of these other colors here. So, so far I got blue and I got green and I got red. Let's now make one that's just kind of uh, pink. Okay, I click okay. And now that's gonna be pink whenever I select it. Fantastic, that's great. And now whatever I do now, while this layer is selected, is gonna end up on this layer. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? That's pretty cool. So if I typed, Let's just go to do a quick little type here. All right. I'm going to say yummy. All right. And that's obviously way too small. Okay. There we go. All right. And I'm just using a keyboard shortcut that I'll teach you later on to be able to make that nice and big. But you can see there it is. My little color there. Let's come there. And then notice it's going to be right there. Fantastic. It's inside of there. Love that. Pretty cool starting my layer management right now sometimes you want to move things around from layer to layer so and you're going to want to do that for a number of reasons number one is for organization purposes because it just belongs someplace else right it's like okay you know what i accidentally drew it inside of the text layer and it needs to be in the avocado layer oops what do i do okay or it actually went into the template layer i didn't want to do that it needs to be on its own layer so it's really easy to get these things out. So let me just show you, let's say I wanted to bring this type or this yummy inside of avocado. Very simply, I click and drag on this circle and just bring it down below. There you go. And now here it is inside of the avocado. Let's bring that back, select it, bring this back up. And now it's inside of type. Okay, so really nice, really straightforward. Um, super important to do. 
The other time you might want to do this is when you have a um, what we call a range or for our layering, if we don't want things to be above or below something, we would actually work with how things are arranged on here, right? So let's just say, for example, I wanted Yummy to be behind this. I could now move this entire layer below, and now you can see it's actually below my avocado. All right, so definitely important stuff. Not the most glamorous of all things in Illustrator, but it is an absolute must to really understand how layers work, layer management, um, why we work with layers, etc. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do here is just simply get rid of this layer. I don't need it right now. So guess what? There is my little trash can. I click on that. Are you sure you want to? I'm gonna say yes. Great, and it is gone. All right, so practice that. Really get to know your layers. Stay organized with your content. Practice, pause the video, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, this avocado has certain colors associated with it. So before I even start drawing my shapes, I would like to have these colors readily available and saved. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my swatches to save my colors, okay? So if you bring up your swatches panel under window and then you go over here to swatches, you'll see I have a number of different saved colors preset from Illustrator. Okay, great. But what I want to do is I want to actually save these colors so I can easily access them when I draw it myself. So very simple process. What we're going to do now is simply go over to here to a new tool that we have not worked with yet. It's called the eyedropper tool. Okay, notice the eyedropper tool. What does an eyedropper do? It basically just sucks things up. So with that chosen, I'm going to go over here to this little color. And you'll notice that my swatches panel now has that color available for me. And very simply, I'm just going to drag that down here into my swatches and it's good to go. How cool is that? Now I can also move this other places. We're going to talk about how we can get organized in just a little bit, but let me just start grabbing some other colors as well. So eyedropper, let's grab that guy and wonderful. Let's go ahead and grab this guy. How easy is that? So let me just, Drag that down, very cool. And now let's get this color and then just drag that down, love that. And let's get this color and drag that down, wait for my plus sign. And okay, and that should be enough for us because uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some of these guys overlap and you're gonna see how the colors are gonna come together accordingly. All right, now, like I said, I'd like to organize all of my, my avocado colors into kind of their own thing. So if you select one and then you hold down the shift key and come over to here, you see where it says new color group, click on that. I'm just gonna call this avo colors and now bam, there that is ready to go. And when I'm ready to draw something out, you'll notice I'm just gonna close this out. Let's just say I'm ready to draw out a shape of sorts. Go back to my shape options. Where are you shape? And you'll see here when I click on the drop down, you can see all my avocado colors are right there, ready to go. All right, so pause the video, use this file, and then save some of your colors that you want to use for your swatches, and then also make a group out of it. We've talked about color so far, where we have created our colors from the color picker. And we've also saved some swatches where we saved all of our swatches for our individual avocado colors. But now let's go a little bit deeper where we're going to work with global colors, right? So global colors are going to allow us to make kind of a universal change that's going to link up to those colors. Okay, so let's just see what I mean by that. So let's just say, for example, I wanted this color to be, let's just make it up here. I'm just gonna come over to here and that's great. That's wonderful. And now I'm gonna bring this into my swatches panel. Let's go there. That's fantastic. But now when I move my mouse over it, you'll see number one, it doesn't have a name. And number two, it is not what we call a global color. So if I double click on this now, you're gonna see here, there's no name for it. 
Okay, and also the color mode was not accurate. So I'm going to first change the color mode to CMYK for it was an RGB. And I'm also going to call this something what I want to call it, crimson red. And then I'm going to choose global. You're going to see what that means in just a few seconds. So I'm going to click OK. That's great. And now I'm going to go over to here and then choose that. And this time I'm going to hold down the shift key, choose that one and that one. Great. Love that. Looks very cool. But then somebody comes along and says, oh, you know what? We're not using that one anymore. We're, 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 we're doing a totally different color. And um, sorry, you just, you just got to change everything. It's like, ah, man. Well, guess what? Because I have made this into a global color, and you'll notice, actually, if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see that little triangle there. As a result of me working with the global color, I'm able to do guess what? I'm going to change this and notice this is crimson red. OK, and then let's go back to my CMYK, still crimson red. And then watch this as I change this to be something completely different. I can click preview to see it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But I'm going to turn that off again and watch this. Click OK. What? That is so cool. Because I said global, OK, that allowed it. OK, it likes to switch back. So just be aware of that. Because it usually it's the color space that you start with, right? So I was not inside of RGB. I'm in CMYK now. Okay, so just keep in mind, keep an eye on that. But the key thing here is the fact that I chose global and I create my color, it's going to make it so everything that had this crimson red associated with it will then be changed. All right, now if I come back over to here, and then I'm just going to change this to army green All right, and again come back over to here make sure that's global good wonderful and let's do that one more time because it's so fun let me just change that now to this look okay and just like that very cool keep in mind there's a lot we can do with our colors choosing our colors from the color picker making them into swatches so we can use them again and again they're saved then we can also group them like we did with our avocado and then you can name them and then also make them into global colors so that way they're linked up when you want to make a change you can change it on a global level across the board so everything's linked up all right so pause the video practice that and we'll come back in our next lesson we're going to learn about how to make patterns So working with colors can definitely give us a little bit of texture, right? Where we can see just adding on colors and different types of colors is super important. We're going to talk about gradients in a little bit. But working with patterns can be something that can really give you a lot of flavor, especially if you're a clothing designer or any kind of real designer that you want to have something a little bit unique. Now, I'm going to make a pattern based off of something I already have here. Illustrator gives you the ability to make patterns that are custom based off of something that you've already created, and you can blend them all together to be able to do this. So you'll notice here I have all of these little vector images, right, that I can now select. Okay, that's great, fantastic. And I'm gonna make a pattern out of these. Okay, so you'll also notice that I can just do this. And that's great, they're all selected, okay? That's just with my regular selection tool. Now, how do I make this into a pattern? Very simply, we're gonna go over here to Object, we're gonna come way down to Pattern, and we're gonna say Make. I know strange language, but I do that, and as soon as I click on that, you're gonna see it says the new pattern has been added to the Swatches panel, very cool. Any changes while in the Pattern Editing mode will be applied to the Swatch upon exit. Okay, that's great, what does that mean? Oh, that's what they're referring to. That just came out of nowhere. So I click OK. And now, whoa, my screen just goes nuts on me. So first thing I'm going to do before I even explain anything is let me just make a name for this. OK, so I'm just going to call this flower. That's great. And you'll see essentially what this craziness is showing me is what my pattern is going to look like. So just imagine this big page I had here. This is giving me a nice little preview of it. This is where I started from. This is my original. 
but I'm able to see, okay, this is what it might look like on this blank document. Okay. You'll also notice that this is the beginning of my pattern. This is where it's going to be saved inside of my swatches panel right there. So that's pretty cool. So I can access that anytime I want. Now let's just check out some of the options that I have here to be able to play around with what I have here, what I've selected, because maybe I like what I did, but I also want to kind of manipulate it a little bit. So it's maybe just not as, you know, linear, you know, I want it to be a little more random, a little more dynamic. So when I click on this area here for tile type, you can see here, you can now manipulate them. So they're going to be a slightly different layout and structure. So keep your eye on some of the shapes when I do this, you'll see, oh, okay. Things just kind of shifted around a little bit, didn't they? Let's try a different one. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. So as you're doing that, things are just kind of getting offset more or less kind of from the center. All right. Now we can take a look at some of these options here. You'll notice here, I can now make this uh, let's just say two inches. Okay. And then notice how the width is getting a little bit wider. Some of these, let's just make this 1.5. Okay. And you'll notice, okay, they're kind of a little bit further away from each other. Let's actually go a little even smaller through that. Oh, that's interesting. A little bit of a different shape, right? So you'll see here how it's now becoming from land from portrait, excuse me, from landscape to portrait. So really depending on what you want. So let me just do again, three, and then let's do two. And then let me say size tile to art and then, oh, okay. You know what? Maybe I want to bring that back to where it was. Okay. Now I'm going to uncheck that and see what other options I can do to give me a little more control on this. So let me just make this again, a little bit wider. I'm going to say 2.2. And you say, okay, that makes it kind of go that way. But now I could now move this over here if I want to. And just notice how everything kind of shifts. I can actually manipulate the individual parts if I want to. See that? That goes over there. And then if I want to, I could then say size tile to art. And then it expands out that much more. Okay. Then you also have here your H spacing, your horizontal spacing and your vertical spacing. Let's see what that does. Let's just bring this up like half an inch. You can see, okay, great. That's my H spacing. It's making things a little bit wider, making things kind of split apart a bit. Let's make this my B spacing also same thing. All right. Maybe you want to have a little less crowded. You can absolutely do that as you apply your pattern. All right. So let me come back to this, bring that in here and let's just maybe overlap these a little bit. See what that does. Let's bring this back to zero and zero and then, okay. Now you can see, all right, kind of interesting, play around with things, however you like. Now this last part is going to be about your overlapping, right? So you can see how this, these guys overlap with each other a little bit. If you don't want this to overlap with that, you can actually change that a little bit by kind of making different ones overlap, whatever's going to be in front or back right? Depending on where the layering is right in your patterns already. Okay. So you'll watch how kind of some of these will then go above or below. So just kind of move this around and just watch how everything changes. And it's going to give me the opportunity to then play around with however I want, how everything's going to go accordingly. I can even make this bigger and watch again, how everything changes. And of course, if I wanted to, I can even change the color of this if I like. All right, so now I'm going to close this out. Go over here. I'm going to say done. I'm going to go over here in the far, far, far upper left. I'm going to say done. And now what's happened now? Not a whole lot, except for the fact I now have a new pattern, right? If you move your mouse over it, but you're going to see here, it's going to be right over here. If you move your mouse over it should tell you this is my flower. Okay. So now when I click on this, I'm going to click on flower and now amazing. Now I have this great pattern that I created that I could easily also recreate in a very different way. Okay. But you can see how amazing that is, right? How cool that I just created this and now it's applying it across the board here. Now, how do I manipulate this? It's very simply just come back over here, double click it. Oh my God. And I'm right back to where I was. And then I can very easily now, okay, let's just try something else again. All right, cool. And that changes, click done. And now everything that was on there before 
has now shifted as a result, okay? Because it's all linked up to this. Okay, so you'll wanna choose your own patterns, whatever you got creating on there, and just, just go to town and just see what you can do. But making the pattern is quite simple. Manipulating it is really kind of a trial and error thing. And then bring it in. If you don't like it, you can always change it after the fact. Okay, so pause the video, practice that, and then find the, the files inside of our courseware. And we'll see you in the next video. I'd like to explain something very briefly uh, called uh, the expand option that you're going to see in Illustrator quite a bit. Right now, what we're looking at here is just a very simple stroke. Now this stroke happens to have a 200 point stroke on here. Like what? Oh my God, I can see that. There's that line. We've done something like this before. And you'll say, okay, that's great. And I can make this smaller. I can make it bigger. And you can see it just makes it bigger or smaller. Let's bring this down to just like 18. Okay, great. I'm going to undo that. Undo that. Bring it back to where I was. Great. So you can see no tricks up our sleeve. This is just a very simple stroke. But now what if I want to do some things to this? Like I wanted to actually like fill this and actually put another stroke around this and do all kinds of different things. Maybe I want to put a gradient inside of this. I can't really do that when it's a stroke. I don't really have the kind of flexibility and functionality as much as I would if this were a shape. Okay, so I want to convert this to a shape. And that's essentially what expanding or expanding the appearance is going to allow us to do. So how do we do that? When I click on object way up on top here, you're going to see there's this option to expand. So essentially what it's going to do is going to convert this, which is now a stroke into a fill. So I click OK. And now very simply, you'll notice I get all of these little anchor points here because this is now one big shape, no longer a stroke. Okay, then I'm going to have the ability to actually put a stroke around this and do all kinds of wonderful things. That's going to give me, you know, a little more creativity and a little more functionality, a little more options to work with. Okay, because now it's a shape. So many times things are starting off as one type of object using one type of, of element, but you want to expand it out so that it becomes a shape to give you a lot more functionality. All right, so we're going to use this exact same shape to discuss gradients. So if you haven't gotten to do this yet, pause the video, take this shape that we have here inside of our gradient strokes image, um, and then make it into, um, expand it into a shape, and then we'll come back and do gradients. Now, as promised, we are going to discuss gradients. This is going to be the first of two discussions on gradients. Now, what is a gradient? Gradient is just one color that blends into another color, and then it puts a whole bunch of colors in between. Okay, so you can see over here in the far upper right of my window here, if you zoom in, you're going to see I've got a few different kind of default gradients that I can apply from my swatches panel. We're not going to do that because I want to be able to create it from scratch and show you how that works. So you will see over here in the lower left of my tools panel, let's go way over here, you're going to see there is this option to apply a gradient. You'll see to the left of that is just my apply color. Here is apply gradient and here is apply no color at all. So let's choose the shape that we just created. And I'm going to simply just click on this gradient. And you'll see just like that, a few things happen. It now applies its default gradient, which is just essentially black to white which essentially just fills it in black to gray to white. That's what, what a gradient is, okay? Another thing that happens is my gradient panel now automatically opens up, which is pretty cool. I kind of like that. Now, if you don't see the gradient panel for whatever reason, if it doesn't show up, you can always go to window and choose gradient and then bam, that pops right up. Fantastic. Now, let's see what we can do to get the gradient that we want. So you'll see that there are a few different types of gradients we can work with. There is the linear gradient, there is the radial gradient, and there's also the freeform gradient, which we're gonna do in another lesson. Now you can see if I click on the dropdown, they've got some preset gradients for me that I can work with. I can simply click on that. Oh, that's pretty neat. Go to there. All right, that's pretty cool. Great, so you know if you're working on something like that where you're just like, hey, I wanna have a gradient that's gonna be like a nice blue sky or an ocean, something like that, you can see the settings are already there for you. I'm gonna go back to my white and black. And you'll also see that down below 
I can now change the angle of my gradient to say that. You'll see how that changes. Let's go to 180, see how that changes. Okay, pretty neat. And then you'll also see how I can change these two options here, which are my different colors. So if I wanna change the colors of this, if I double click now, you're gonna see this little window pops up. And because this is just white, I don't get a whole lot of options here except for black and white. So what I have to do is click on my little flyout menu here, and then I'm gonna to go to CMYK. Then all my colors now appear, and I'm gonna make this, so let's just go over here to red. That's great. And then I'm gonna go over to here, again, double click, and then let's make that go to green, all right? And you can see I'm going from red to red to red to red to less red to more green. Okay, great. Or if I want to choose my color exactly, maybe I want to do like bright red to dark red. Okay, kind of interesting. But I'm going to play around with this a little bit more by using this little diamond here to say, hey, listen, I want a little more of this kind of like darker red or maybe you want a little bit of that. Okay, so you have a little bit of texture. So you can see what the gradient is doing for me. Let's now apply a slightly different kind of gradient, which is gonna be a radial gradient. I choose that, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just maybe have some different colors here. So I'm gonna come over to here, and I'm gonna choose, let's just say a lighter blue here, and then I'm gonna choose a darker blue. So let's go to here, and we'll see, oh, that's kind of interesting. So now I'm starting to see what the difference is. What is the difference? Linear gradient, it just does like a line, right? Very simple line, and depending on the angle you choose, that is going to make it go where it goes, right? So it's gonna go 45 degrees, the line's gonna be 45 degrees. A radial gradient is just a rounded thing. You can see how it's starting from the middle and it's going outward just like that, okay? Now, let's say I kinda like this, but it's not exactly what I want, all right? I wanna have more control over my gradient. How can I do that? There is this really awesome tool called the gradient tool. Just like that, it looks like a little black to white gradient. So what I'm gonna do now is now manipulate this simply by clicking on the gradient tool. And guess what? All I need to do is just start clicking and dragging where I want it to begin and end. See that? I'm gonna start over here this time. And I have a little more subtle thing here. Maybe I'm gonna go over to here. And okay, or maybe I'm gonna start in the middle here and then kind of just have a, like a little blast off thing. All right, that's kind of interesting, right? Let me try that now with my linear gradient. And you'll see I can do the same exact thing. Let's just have it go from here to here. Oh, I kind of like that. Maybe I'll just do it from here to there. Okay, interesting. But again, I'm still not satisfied because what I'm trying to do maybe is have something a little bit more kind of complex. So I can actually add on more gradient colors to this if I want to. So I can literally just click anywhere on here to add on what we call gradient stops, if you like. So I'm just gonna click, 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 okay, that's great. And let's just play around, see what we can do, adding on some more things here. So let's go from a very, very light blue, just bring that down to maybe a little bit less light. All right, so just kind of inch that down. Okay, and then maybe just for fun, I'll just kind of throw in a little bit of a hue, see what that does. Okay, and now let's go a little bit more of that. Okay, interesting, kind of liking this. All right, and now kind of like that. All right, let's just see what that does now. After I experiment with now with my gradient tool, let's go from top all the way to the bottom. And now you can see I've created this cool little sky. I like that. And now it's kind of coming right into like the ocean, for example. If I go the opposite direction, notice what that does, right? Very different. Maybe if I stop right here, I'm still gonna get a little bit of that dark blue. And you can see they're good enough to show me, let me just back out a little bit. They're good enough to show me what these individual colors are, right, that I'm working with here. So if you wanted to change those, you can simply click on them and then notice there we are, and then you can change that to something completely different. Okay, so there's really, really a lot you can do with this. Okay, by with gradients, you can be super creative. Of course, you don't want to go over the top, but you know, gradients, a lot of times they have a purpose. You know, you can be 
like illustrating with it, but many times you might have a gradient that's gonna be just sort of like a background for something. You know, you might just wanna have like just a gradient as a shape. Let me just find my shapes. So I'll just do something like this. And I'm just gonna put it as a nice little background so I'll be able to see it underneath my avocado base here. Okay, let me just bring that down into this layer. And let me go out and just unlock these, unlock that, and then bring that all the way down so I can see it inside of here. Let's bring that way down below. Great, now that looks pretty cool, but let's just have a little bit of texture here so I can just make this shape here into a nice little gradient. So making sure nothing is selected, of course, except for my backdrop there, and just making sure that only this is selected. Very good, very important and I click on that. And, all right, on my way, but not exactly what I want, so I go over here to my radial gradient, and you can see how it's now starting to kind of form a little bit of a sort of a halo around it to kind of really draw the eyes of my user right into it. So I can choose different colors if I want to, and we go over here to my CMYK, and then maybe I have these saved someplace, but let's just do a little bit of dark green and then over here i'll make this a little bit more on the whiter side all right and guess what i can do next is i can reverse it so i'm going to reverse it just by going over to here and now oh okay kind of like that again that's a nice little halo effect and maybe i want a little bit more of that halo i can do that so i click on this and go to my gradient tool, and then just get a little bit more light or a little less light, just playing around however you like. Okay, and then making sure when you make your selection that only the object you like is selected, so therefore I don't get accidentally get everything else here. So I can now just manipulate this just a tiny bit. You can see that, pretty cool. It's just like shining a little bit of light on that. So just think about if you had a model, if you had a logo, if you had, you know, a product that you're selling that working with a gradient of that's a radial can actually just draw some attention to that object, you know, but very subtle. It's like a little halo. Okay, so practice that a little bit. Um, and when we come back, we're going to work with a free form gradient. So, so far we've talked about two different types of gradients, both our linear gradient and also our radial gradient. Okay, so the linear is just gonna go in a straight line, but all kinds of different angles if you want. And the radial gradient is gonna be rounded, right? So you can see how we can go from the center and outward, and also you can reverse it. And again, you can play around with it using the actual gradient tool to just manipulate the direction and the magnitude of where it's gonna go. In this lesson, we're gonna learn about the amazing free form gradient. And that's gonna give you all kinds of different control over where you want your gradient to be and to the certain extent of where you want it to be. All right, now I'm looking at this ocean where there's a map there and I wanna be able to manipulate this so it's gonna really look like a map would look where there's gonna be kind of maybe darker waters around here, lighter waters out here, whatever it is. So let's see how I do that. Making sure that my gradients panel is up. Go over here to window, go over here to gradient, bring that up, fantastic. And remember earlier we talked about these first two and I promise you we talk about this third one, which is the free form gradient. So as soon as I click on that, you'll see everything on this background now turns into something that I didn't really ask for, okay? Let's not worry about that because we're gonna be able to change that no problem. So I'm gonna now just start clicking on all these different places of where I think I want the different kind of colors to be. Don't worry about getting it perfect for right now. Okay, great. Now you'll notice also, if I decide I don't want these anymore, I could just go ahead and select them and then hit delete. You got some extra ones there, just hit delete and they're gone. You can also move these around, move this one closer. Okay, and you'll notice as I'm doing that, the color also changes of whatever that gradient is. Now, these are not my favorite colors. This is not what the ocean looks like. Let's hope not the ocean doesn't look like where you live. 
So what I'm going to do is now actually change this to what I want. So if you double click on this now, you're going to see it's going to take me to my color picker essentially. So I can now choose this color. Ooh, I love that. That is fantastic. Okay, great. And you'll notice what it does. You'll see that I go from this kind of whatever blue outwards out like that. So you can say, oh, okay, pretty neat. So let's go ahead and double click on that again. Say, all right, very cool. I can change that if I like. So let's go ahead and do one more time. And let's now choose that same ish kind of color, but let's maybe come in a little bit closer to here and we'll see what that does. And you'll see as these kind of move around, they're kind of blending in with each other. So the gradient goes from one color and it pays attention to the other colors near it. So let's just watch this. Okay, all right, nice. I can see what you're doing there. Okay, let's go back to this one. And let's try some more, maybe do it a slightly different way, just to really kind of get the feel for like what the tool does. And then maybe I'll move this one a little bit closer and this one's gonna be darker than the rest of them. Because maybe when it's by land, it's gonna be different. Okay, wow. That is really cool. Adding on some pretty cool texture. So let's go over to here and this one might be a little bit lighter, but I still want it to be blue. And I want it to blend in with whatever's next to it. Again, free form. So I'll just finish this off. Let's come over to here and then simply double click on it. And just find the color you like, just picking and choosing whatever's going to work for you. Don't worry about it if it's not perfect. All right, and let's do a little bit more. Simply double click. All right, now, sometimes you might want these to kind of be spread out a little more sort of diffuse. So if you'll notice here on the outside of this is the option for me to now spread this out or bring it in. See how it changes? So you can see how it becomes a little bit more kind of spread out. So let me bring this over here. We'll see what that does. Bring that over there, see what that does. Maybe come out, we'll go in. Let's do some more. Notice how they're all talking to each other. And let's do one more. And then guess what? I can also choose it from my swatches if I have a save swatch. And this one probably doesn't belong. It's kind of manipulating things a little bit. Get rid of that one. All right, and look at what we did. Look at where we started compared to where we are right now. Really gives you all kinds of control. And this could really be on anything. This is just a map that we've chosen here, but this could be just like you know an animal. It could be a flag. It could be just a logo, whatever kind of creativity you want to do, right? So, I mean, just really start to think about this. You know, this is just a lot of the similar colors, but you can just go as crazy as you want with like lots and lots of other colors and just see how they blend in together when you kind of move them closer to each other and what kind of things can be created. So I'm gonna go and undo that, bring it back to where we just created that and you're good to go. So gradients are an incredible tool. You'll see them in pretty much everything. And maybe it's you're just making a logo, maybe you're just making an icon for an app or something like that. You'll see gradients everywhere from the more simple to the more complex. All right, so experiment, play around, have fun, and we'll see you in the next video. Now, a key part of working with Illustrator and being very organized is understanding artboards. Now I've alluded to artboards when I gave my initial overview and tour of the program. Now we're going to get a little bit deeper into artboards. Now, why do we create artboards? Could be for a number of different reasons. Maybe you're going to mock up a number of different versions, different prototypes for your projects. Could be that you're printing multiple pages. You know, you just want to stay organized in a particular way. Now for me, I have three artboards here and you'll see that I have this avocado, I've got this little bottle here and I also have this little pepper here. 
these are three individual artboards, right? To the naked eye, they look like just three pages, right? And that's kind of essentially what they are. Now, how do I know that I'm even working with artboards? How can you even tell that these are artboards? Number one, you'll see that way down lower left, you'll see way down there, you're gonna see right now that says one. When I click on that, you can see one, two, three. Oh, okay. There are these individual artboards that I can very easily go to, right? So just like going from one page to the other. Let me zoom out a little bit so we can see all three of them. Okay, now another thing you might wanna do is actually bring up the artboards panel. That's not open for you right now. So go over to window, we'll open up to artboards, and we're gonna see, oh, very good. Now I can actually see each of these, I can go directly to them, I can rename them, right? So all that stuff there, great, great. Let's don't do that. <laughs> Show you that in just a second. Okay, click on that, click on that. And if you were really zoomed in, this could be a really good way to just navigate from one to the other. Okay, see, great. So just going right in there. So it's kind of a good one to have. You'll also notice in the artboard panel, I have the option to create a new artboard if I want to, and also to delete an artboard if I want to. All right, so let's just again zoom back out. The next thing I wanna show you is the artboard tool, the artboard tool. So if you look over here in our tools, you'll see that there is this little guy right here, it's supposed to look like an artboard. When you click on that, you'll see all of your artboards that are currently labeled now show up with little bounding boxes here. And this is actually really critical because a lot of times people get kind of confused and they're like, well, I have the artboards panel up, but how do I understand where my artboards are? How do I deal with them? How do I move them around? How do I rename them? How can I now manipulate this? And how can I really understand it? And that is making sure the artboards tool is then selected. All right, now I may want to now manipulate these to kind of change the order of things a little bit. So notice my artboard tool is selected and I might wanna have this down here. That's a better structure for me. Great, and now this is gonna go over to here. Okay, good. Oh, I like that much better because this is just the way I wanna show it. And now let me go ahead and create a new artboard, come over to here. And now I wanna move that down here. Wonderful, that's great. Now, of course, I'm gonna change the name of this. But I want you to notice that as a result of me now being in the artboard tool, I can now do a number of different things to the artboard, right? You'll see that I can manipulate the size of it. So this little transform bounding box now appears and I can actually just cinch that in because maybe I don't really need it to be so big at all. All right, just printing out more than it needs to. So I can just manipulate it however I like. Okay, so let's go ahead and undo that, but just know how easy that is. And again, very important, because I'm working with the artboard tool to be able to do that. Now I have this artboard 189. I'm just gonna very simply change that to some nachos, simply double click on that. And then that's ultimately gonna be nachos. Very cool. It's really very, very simple. Then I would start putting my content inside of that artboard. And then therefore it's going to stay in there. And then when I print it out, you're gonna see everything will be part of that page, if you will. Okay, now if you wanna get a little more advanced with your artboards, you can see that there's this little icon here to the far right. If you just double click on those, they're gonna give you some good options. One way to rename it, you can go through here, change the width and the height, very similar to what I just showed you earlier, and then also your orientation. And then do you wanna show some of these things here? Do you care about showing the center mark, the crosshair, all that stuff here? You can definitely do that if you like. Just turn these things on if you want to. Click OK. And you can see, all right, good. Maybe that's a little more organized of how you want to work. Okay, and when I'm ready to export, I can go over here to File, Export, and you're gonna see there's this option way up on top here for artboards. So maybe when I'm ready to export, I don't wanna export all of these, right? So I can just uncheck this and uncheck this, and I'm only ready to export just this artboard if I want to. Great, and it's gonna export it to a particular folder, whatever I wanna do. Great, and I'm good to go. So they do really give you that option to be able to do that, giving you that control over what I wanna save and what I don't wanna save, okay? So 
kind of valuable to just know how we can really master all of our organization, understanding the value of art boards, to be able to, again, really structure your content where you want it, in addition to everything we've done with layers, but you might want to put individual pieces of art in one artboard because maybe it's going to be a different size, different page size, you know, what have you. It's going to have kind of different properties all together. Maybe you're experimenting with different prototype, different, different comps. You might want to play around with it accordingly. All right. So having all those different artboards can help you with that. Okay. So remember, can be a little bit confusing because you have to actually access your artboard tool to see all these here, as well as seeing your artboard panel to be able to access them individually. And if you want to go a little extra, you can just click on this area here. And if you want to get rid of artboards altogether, you can just go ahead and click on that. And also you can move them around however you like. While it's selected, just bring that over and great. And I can move this over here. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video, practice that, have fun with it, and hopefully you see the value in this for all your projects. And we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, there might be times that you'd like to just export or save one particular image that's living within your file. So for example, if I wanted to just have this little pepper here, I can then export that as its own individual file, PMG or whatever that file format is. So if I simply just right click on there, you're gonna notice there's this option to export selection. When I choose that, you'll see this nice little dialog box pops up and similar to what we've seen before when we looked at our artboards, what do you want to export? I'm just gonna click on assets and then notice what I just right clicked on there is right there. Fantastic, that's great. It's gonna ask me where do I wanna save it to? Fantastic, wonderful. Super happy with that. And it's also gonna ask me what type of file type do I wanna save this as? So notice I can do PNG, I can do SVG, I can do PDF, right? I can do JPEG, all kinds of different things. And also notice with JPEG, you can ratchet it down in terms of your compression levels. Now, just in terms of what these things mean, PNG is good for transparency. And if you have a JPEG around it, it means that that transparency is gonna be gone meaning that this outside is gonna be saved as white, okay? And then SVG is a scalable vector graphic, okay? Um, very important stuff to be able to make your image come in nice and smooth, especially if you're gonna put it onto the web and you think people are gonna look at it in mobile devices. Um, so it does work well on the web. Okay, it might be a little bit bigger, it might be a little bit harder to work with, so just understand. Before you do that, just make sure you, you get how to work with it. Okay, and then PDFs are just PDFs. So however you wanna do that, totally up to you. All right, so I could just click on export and it's gonna save it to that particular folder, right? I save that there and then bam, I'm good to go. Now, let's now see how we can do it in maybe a different way, to go a little more complex. So with this selected, I'm gonna go over here to window and this time I'm gonna choose asset exports and you'll see that there is now a new tab called asset export. And then I could simply use the same one if I want to. All right, so just gonna be right there. Okay, that's great. And the other thing I could do is, guess what? I can add on to this. So if I want us to start collecting things, I can now collect this and add it onto here as well. All right, now I want you to notice that in the lower right over here, I have a few different options. This is just, hey, generate a single asset from the selection, that's great. But you also may want to generate multiple assets from the selection. So I have this here and I'm just gonna click on that. And now, oh, look at that. Now my avocado comes in and now I have both of these. So maybe I just wanna have these individual ones. Maybe they're on the same artboard and I just wanna be able to collect them all, be good to go, and then ultimately save it, export it as whatever kind of file type you want, okay? So lots of options for you to work with. Pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're gonna create this avocado and we're gonna be using some basic shapes. We're gonna be using some of our swatches we created, but more importantly, we're gonna learn a new tool called the Shape Builder tool to be able to create all of these really kind of like perfect little edge kind of shadows around all of this, okay? Now, if you look inside of my current layer, you'll notice here I have all of these like little individual layers that are basically kind of creating that illusion 
of depth within all of this, right? So all of these are their own individual shapes. You can see them just double clicking in there to get into them, right? Because they're all kind of grouped. So you can see here, I'm going to create that. Now let's see how we create that. First thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this. So if I create a new layer down here and I'm going to duplicate this entire layer by holding down the alt or option key and simply clicking up and putting that in there. That's great. I now have a duplicate of this layer and I'm just going to call this Avo trace, making sure this is selected, go to my move tool. And then I'm just going to bump that over with my arrow keys, also holding down the shift key. And now that's there for me to actually trace. Okay. That's great. Now I'm keeping two on here because I don't really want to mess up this first one that I did. Okay. So I'm going to keep that there, but this is going to be designed to be traced. So what I'm going to do now is just lock this and also lock this. So I don't mess with it at all. All right. So very cool. Now I'm going to create another layer and this is going to be Avo new. Okay, so just imagine this is something that, you know, it's just a, you know, a bitmap that you got someplace, but you want to make it into, guess what? You want to make it into a vector image. So how do we do it? All right, so you're going to learn not only about that shape builder tool, but you're also going to learn maybe some techniques that you may not have thought about how to actually create shapes in kind of a nice way. Now, before we start building, let me just go ahead and choose my color. I'm only going to use three of the colors for now. Um, not including the pit and let me just simply draw out a circle to start off this little back part here. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of eyeball it for right now, holding down my shift key and my alt or option key on the Mac and try to get it as kind of center to that bottom part as possible and do your best. Okay. Not bad. Let me just undo that. Alt shift and maybe you try again. All right. That's pretty good. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect and happy with that. But now I need to move this part up here. So it looks a little more avocado -y. So again, I go over here to my direct selection tool. I'm going to select this guy, making sure that this is isolated again, using my arrow keys with my shift key. It's going to go farther, faster. It goes about 10 pixels and we're doing pretty good right till you get to the tip not bad at all. Now these guys need to go up as well. So what I can do is I can click on each of these collectively, right? Holding down my shift key. And again, with my move tool selected, just go ahead and bump that up. Okay. And then I'm just going to make this guy go out a little bit. Now you see that it's coming together. And then this guy, same thing. Just using my arrow keys. Very good. Looking for a little bit of precision if possible. And then finally down here, I can then make this guy go out a little bit wider using my Bezier. Come over to here using my Bezier. Not too bad. Okay. And by the way, to keep it straight as you use your Bezier, also hold down the shift key. All right. Now, of course, I could kind of maybe perfect this a tiny bit more if you're kind of following along there. Okay, not bad. Again, holding down my shift key. Nice. That fills it in. Do one more. Again, really kind of understand how the tools work, why they're doing what they're doing. Great. I love that. That is fantastic. It's good to go. So notice where I am, what layer I'm on. So now what I'm going to do in order to set myself up for the next steps with my stencil is I'm going to duplicate this. I'm going to clone it by holding on the alt or option key and just bring this over here. Okay. And I'm just going to call this guy here, my stencil. All right. So I don't get it confused with the other ones. It doesn't even really matter what color it is. You can change the color because you're really just going to use it to act as the stencil. Now let's come back to here and then we can just call this like, base or something like that. So we kind of know what it is. Good idea just to always work with your layer management and name things. So this is now set up, ready to go. And now I need to make this little inner part here. And so what do I do? How do I do that? Super simple. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. You can go here to edit and copy. Great. And now next thing I do is just say edit and I'm going to say paste in front. And now there's this here again as base. Hmm. I'm not sure if I want that. 
So I'm just going to say second level. OK, so that's very clear what that is. Now let's choose a color for this and I'll just choose there. That's great. And now I'm going to bring this in concentrically. So when I do that, it's going to kind of fit the perfect shape of where it started from. So earlier we did shift and alt to work concentrically. We're going to do the same thing. Watch this. Click and drag in and nice. We're on our way. All right. So that's all you do. OK, notice how it came in from the corners and the center stayed in place. All right. If you want to go a little bit more outward, you can absolutely do that. Play around with whatever you need to do. OK, so that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Now, let's do our first little kind of sliver here. And we're not going to do the entire thing. I just want you to learn the tool so you can see how this works. We'll do one little level on the back part of the avocado and then we'll do this little pit and then you can practice as well. I'm going to give you um, another thing that you can practice on. I'm going to give you another tool that you can try to create um, based off of another exercise and I'm going to provide for you. Okay, because the best way for us to learn this is to practice Okay, all these exercise files. So now let's now say I want to have another one that's just like this right whatever that's going to be another one another one another one just like that on top of on top of on top of that so i'm going to copy this and again going to paste in front and now there's another one right here and why did i do that i did that so i can then sliver right through that particular one All right so hmm okay kind of hear you what you're talking about but let's see what's going to happen now i'm going to introduce you to this little guy right here this is my, move your mouse over, it'll tell you, your shape builder tool. It's incredible. It allows you to kind of use little stencils to either combine things or also take things away. I'm gonna again use this as a little stencil. Say, hey, listen, I don't want all this part here, right? Because I wanna kind of just, you know, kind of move away, move away, move away from that part. So with this now selected, I'm just gonna move this to kind of like create the shape of the element that essentially I'm going to sort of, you know, keep and also what I'm going to remove. So they're kind of covering each other here. All right. And let's do that. It's great. And both of these now need to be selected. So I'm going to hold down the shift key, select this guy. And now go over here to my shape builder tool. And you'll notice I have a little plus sign here next to it. And I move my mouse over it. Things get kind of like gray and all that. I actually want to remove it. I don't want to add to it. So I hold down the Alt key. Notice I get the minus sign, click, and then click. And now I have that little, little thing there. But what I need to do with that is change the color of that. So then it becomes reflective of what I am now trying to do. Okay, so let's click away so we can really see that. Nice, that is pretty cool. Now think about when you might want to do this. Think about shadows. Right, of like on a person, on a vehicle, on a product, right, on just anything. Anytime you want to add on a little dimensionality, but you also want to conform it perfectly to something that already exists. Notice how nicely that just goes around that. We're going to do something similar with this avocado pit. Okay, so this time let's do that one more time. See how that's going to go. And I'm going to choose this. I'm going to choose my color this time, which is this brown guy that I created. All right. And then I will just now draw it out. And I'm just going to do the same thing with my little circle. And then just make it kind of overlap a little bit. And now let's just come to here with my direct selection tool. You can always hit the A key if you like. And just bump that up a little bit. Let's not be super perfect here. And just a lot of times I like to count how many I do. So I do it on both sides. So I'm just going to go ahead and just say one, two, one, two. Great. And then this guy, let's bring that down as well. And that does not need to be perfect, really, because, hey, you know what? This is nature. Nature is not entirely perfect. OK, so again, this doesn't have to be exactly like this, but I might want to create something like this to be able to kind of just sliver this in. So it's going to be a very similar process for me, okay? Where I'm going to just copy, paste in place, and I'm going to use this 
as my little stencil. So let me just get that there, right? So I just clone that guy. And then I clone this again by copying and pasting and front. And again, that new guy is only there so I can then just remove it. All right, that's really the only reason. It seems excessive, but that's essentially what's happening here. So let's now move this right on top of here and then get whatever kind of like shadowy thing you need. And then I'm gonna click on this. So I have both and now use my shape builder tool, hold down the alt key, bam, bam. And now there's that sliver that now needs to be made a little bit darker. So I'm gonna double click on that. And then let's just bring our brightness down a little bit darker for that element. Click OK. And now, cool, nice. And you see how perfectly that fits in with my pit. OK, so we're really making some progress here. It's starting to look very cool. It's starting to look like it really has some dimensionality. It's very smooth and everything. Now, you have another um, exercise that I want you to try to emulate in addition to what we've done here, which is this potted plant set here. Now there's a lot to work with here and it's pretty much just basic shapes. And we've now just put other shapes on top of other shapes and we've just changed the color of them and we've removed certain parts of it. That's all we've done. Really, it's not as complicated as this may seem. Like some of these shadows here, right? You can see that's just a shadow, but notice how it fits perfectly underneath the pot. Another one here, right? So you can see this fits perfectly inside of here as well. Okay, and then look at these guys. See this? This element right there, that's because of what we've done in terms of to make it fit right on top of it inside of itself. Okay, and even like the creation of this pot down below was the effect of working with the shape builder tool. All right, I want you to really practice the, the tools and the fundamentals of what we just did working with our avocado and then apply it to the potted plant and see if you can create this on your own. Okay, so pause the video, really practice this because these tools are invaluable. They will help you in almost every capacity. Take a look at vector images all over the place. They're not just basic shapes, but they're also little shadows to create the illusion of dimensionality and depth. Okay, so have fun and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, in this exercise, we are going to discuss the pen tool and we're going to make this as painless as possible. This is something that really stresses a lot of people out. So let's make it so it's not super stressful for you and just kind of really make it so it's it's understandable and kind of logical for you to work with. Now, the pen tool does not necessarily work the way a pen actually does in real life. The pencil tool does, and you'll see that in another exercise. But the pen tool is a little bit more sort of unique in its style. So let's bring up the pen tool, first of all, and you'll see there it is. And I can right click on it. You can see, bam, there's the pen tool. So I now have this activated. And we're going to now create some basic shapes using the pen tool. But before I do anything at all, I want to establish, well, what's my fill and what's my stroke? So I'm gonna say I don't want any fill at all. So I click on the fill and then I'm gonna choose this guy right here where it says none. I don't want to have a fill because I'm gonna keep it nice and simple where I just have a black stroke. So let's just say I wanna just do a shape with some corners. It's super, super easy. You simply just click on where the corners are gonna go. So click once, go to here, Go to here, go to here, go to there, and then wait for my little circle to close out my loop. And bam, I now have a shape that I can now select and I can move this around and do whatever I want with it, okay? And I can, I can rotate it, you know, I can come back, I can even add, add a fill color to this if I like. Okay, great, so now it's as easy as that, okay? So just about the corners in this case. Now, let's discuss how we do something with curves, all right? so. With curves, it's a little bit more nuanced, okay? Because earlier, remember how I just click, click, clicked? Now, instead of just click, click, clicking, I'm gonna click and drag. So watch what happens now when I click and drag, and then I come over to here, watch what happens now. It's like, oh, it kind of gives birth to this nice little curve here. 
So now I'm going to click and drag again. I'm going to come over to here, click and drag again. Notice I'm going straight down and then click and drag again and then come meet it, finish it, click and drag again. Okay, and you'll notice because I am working with curves, it gives birth to all those little Bezier handles that we've talked about before. Okay, so it's a pretty relatively simple thing once you sort of like master it, you know, I mean, I don't want to minimize, you know, kind of the frustration and the oddness around the pen tool, but it really is a matter of just simplifying it, just click, 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 or click and drag as you're working with things. All right. Now, there might be some times when you want to add on anchor points, and we're going to do that in the next exercise, but I really want you to just at this point, really just practice working with just click and then click and drag, click, click and drag, and just kind of move it around. And you will get that muscle memory as you move things around in a nice, you know, kind of fluid, quick way. And again, remembering, am I actually putting a fill in there? Or am I just doing a stroke? Am I doing both? Right, totally up to you. All right, and then if you didn't get it right, don't worry about it because guess what? You can always go back to your direct selection tool and then manipulate it however you want to. It's like, oh man, I should have done that. Great. Oh, you know, this is a little bit too far over to the right. Okay, great. So I can now select this and then I'll just do that. Oh, okay, great. That's super easy. So don't worry about it. When you're working with the pen tool, it's not about perfection. A lot of times people just kind of trace around it and they do a very rough little sketch around it. And then they just fix it later on in the direct selection tool. All right, so practice that. Maybe you want to have something that's underneath it that you're going to trace, but practice that and we'll see you in the next exercise. We talked about the pen tool. Now we should talk about the pencil tool. Where does the pencil tool live? How do we work with that? So you'll see kind of buried inside of one of these guys here. You'll see, oh, there it is. It's inside with my brushes. Sometimes you got to kind of fish around for these, but I like to actually use some of these keyboard shortcuts. Notice here is N for pencil, or maybe you want to kind of fly this out like I showed you earlier and just kind of have that ready to go. Now, I'm going to use the pencil tool. Pencil tool, as I said earlier, is going to be a little bit more intuitive to what you want to do. Some of you may just decide to use the pencil tool, right? Now, because again, it's just a matter of like clicking and dragging to kind of draw something out. So again, let's make it so I do not have a fill. And this time I'm going to go up to here to my control bar and I'm just going to say no fill. That's great. And this time, you know what? Let's make that a little bit thicker. That's great. And choose my pencil tool. And watch this. Just I'm going to make a nice little wavy line. Cool. See how easy that was? Nice. How about I make a little circle? Come over to there. Nice. Okay, actually, that wasn't very nice because I need to close my loop. Okay, did you see the first time I did that? I did not close my loop. Let me try that one more time. Let me just show you here. Look at the little circle that happens as soon as I meet it. See that? Illustrator is like, okay, that's where you started from. Let's close the loop. If you don't close the loop, then you can't fill it in with a color because it doesn't recognize it as a finished shape. Okay. Now, as I do that, you'll notice, okay, pretty cool. I have all of these individual path points. Okay. That's great. Love that. And I'm pretty much good to go. And I can now fill this in with whatever I want. And you know, that's really kind of all I want you to take away for right now, because this is sometimes all you will need to do when you're just drawing something out. Maybe you're tracing something. You just start with this. OK, don't stress about it. Don't worry too much about how to get the perfection, understand the Bezier handles and all the anchor points. Just use the tools that are comfortable for you, understanding your strokes, understanding your fills. And more importantly, understanding how we can use our direct selection tool to then make changes to these according to what we want on these little path points. See that? So I can now control this however I want. See that? Click and drag, and that's going to go there. Oh, that's cool. Okay, and I can use my little Bezier handles. All right, I can just manipulate that however I want. Sometimes it's a little hard to click on. Great. There you go. Fantastic. All right, so now. This was the pencil tool, but I was able to do something very simple, but actually or similar as what I did with my pen tool, but just by clicking and dragging. All right. So pause the video, practice that, and we'll come back with more stuff.
Now, I would be remiss if I did not talk about how to be a little more structured, a little more organized with how you actually draw some of these things out to have some perfection with your drawing. So this is gonna go the same for whether it's the pen tool or the pencil tool. What I currently have here is this little grid system set up here. You guys just turn that on. So you can turn that on, turn that off. And I'm doing this here so I can now just kind of snap to my grid options, right? Whether it's a shape that's on there or I'm just gonna go ahead and draw some things out. So if you know you're gonna draw out like either a shape or a square or something like that, you can use these little grid options, right? So whether it's pen, whether it's pencil, whether it's a shape, anything else, these little grid options are gonna really, really help us. So let's just do a very simple, just basic drawing. And I'm just gonna simply click and then notice how that's gonna allow me just to go right there and then go, let me, there you go, so it snaps into place. I want that, good, thank you very much. And you can see how now I'm able to be a little perfectionist about it. Okay, this guy's in the way. So I need to just move him out of the way. Are you waiting for me patiently? Love that. Okay, so you can see, all right, that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm just gonna hit enter. And now, Nick, notice how nice and even that is. Okay, because I'm using these little guys right here, right, our grids to be able to now be structured with all that. If I were to be drawing out a shape of some kind, let's now just click and drag, and then bam, that's gonna go there. Now you wanna make sure before you even like set out to do all these things to make sure that your snapping is in fact an option here. So if you look over here on the right hand side, way over here, you have these snap options to work with. And you'll see here is snap to points, snap to grid, okay? And then snap to pixels if you want things to snap to each other. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna simply click and look at that, how it just kind of now does that. Okay, first time, not so much. I was kind of eyeballing it. They were acting as what they were doing, but now it's really doing it. Before I had to kind of just really eyeball it. Now, whatever I draw, look at that. It's snapping to all those squares as a result of that. Okay, so very, very cool. The next thing you might want to do is work with um, guides. You might want to work with guides to make sure that, hey, when I draw something out, I want the, everything to be sort of in line with each other and they can actually snap to the guides. So in order to actually work with guides, we need to make sure that our ruler is visible. So in order to bring up the ruler, just click in kind of the pasteboard, the, sort of the neutral area up here, and then come over to here and then choose the ruler. So I choose that, there's my ruler, that's great. And very simply, in order to create a guide, all we do is click on the ruler and drag down, and then notice how you can actually lock that also to any one of these grids, and then gotta make sure that it is now visible, okay? So you'll notice how mine was not visible, so I had to make sure that this is in fact visible. So you can see here, my guides were hidden, sometimes they're not. So we wanna make sure that they are in fact visible. Okay, because that could make you go crazy. Let's bring this over here. And again, it just say, all right, I am now gonna make stuff go here, here, and here. So let's just do for every one of my peaks, I now have this all set up to be now all aligned of how I wanna do this. Now, let's say, oops, you know what? Our valley is gonna be right here. So I can very simply move this up. Oh, no, but no, I can't. Weird, why can't I do that? Because guess what? My guide is locked. See that? By default, it will be locked. So I unlock that, come over to here, and now I can drag that up. And now that is a perfectly nicely set up set of structure and organization for me to work with all of my content there. All right, so before you go any further with all your drawing, make sure that you've mastered your guides and your grids, making sure that you're snapping, make sure you unlock them, make sure that, or if, if you want to unlock, the, unlock them, that is, and also make sure that they are visible as well. Now, some people like to go so far as to put their guides on a completely different layer, okay? So that might be something that you like to do. So I might wanna just do this and say guides, because then they're not gonna be interfering with anything else that I'm working with, and then you can see also, when I select them, now they turn red. So it also stands out, so it's a little bit different from my 
other elements on the page, which are now blue. See, these are highlighted in blue. These are now highlighted in red. See that? It's all about making this a more fluid process for you. Okay, so make sure before you move forward that you're all set up and you're comfortable with grids and guides. See you in the next lesson. So far, we have drawn out our shapes using the pen tool, the pencil tool, and even the shape tool. But now sometimes when you use some of these tools, in particular the pencil tool, you're going to see that you maybe sometimes get more anchor points than you want to meaning it can just be like a little bit sloppy and a little bit sort of like bumpy, et cetera. So as an example, let me go over here to my pencil tool and I'm just gonna just kind of draw here, you know, just like I'm just kind of really trying to like trace something here and I'm just kind of doing whatever and I'm just not having a great time doing it, but I'm doing my best. I don't have like the steadiest hand. All right, now no need to worry because there is an option within your pencil tool called the smooth tool. Does everybody want the smooth tool? What the smooth tool is going to do is smoothen these out so you don't have so many anchor points. So I click on that and I'm just going to simply just click and drag and notice I get a little smoother, right? So less of these. Now I'm going to have to do a little more than that. Okay, great. All right, fantastic. Maybe some more over here. But now before I go further with my smooth tool, Let's see how I can see my options for my smooth tool. If you double click on the smooth tool, guess what? Hey, how much fidelity do you want in terms of your accuracy versus the smoothness? It's like, you know what? I want real smoothness, right? Because my accuracy is not going to really get me anywhere in this case. I just really want a smooth line here. So, oh, great. So let's make that really smooth. So then we've changed basically the kind of like properties of my smooth tool. So I click OK. And now when I do it, click and drag. See that? That is way more powerful. Oh my God, that's so much better. Let's do some more here. Nice. OK, how about this one? Oh man, that's that's a fun. Oh, look at that. And it's got a big curve there. Nice. I'm going to keep going with that. Smooth that out. Oh, nice. So you can see what I'm doing here. Maybe I want to go even further. Cool. You can see how that looks so much better since when I started. Okay, so use the smooth tool, pause the video, practice that. We'll see you in the next video. Now at this point, we have talked about strokes to a minor degree, and we're going to have a few lessons on strokes and even more detail in a little bit. But I want you to just see kind of how we can work with strokes a little bit more kind of nuanced. So of course, you know how we can we can increase our strokes. That's great. But I guess you bet you didn't know. Say that again. But I bet you didn't know we can even have more nuances over here by changing different elements of the stroke. Notice how it now made it, how it was just a little more kind of a different width, different widths kind of going this way, different widths going that way. Okay, kind of cool, kind of interesting. Let me come back to this. And guess what? You can also go a step further by now doing something like that. So it looks more like kind of a charcoal situation. And guess what? You can even do something like that or do something like that. These are all known as strokes, right? Or brush strokes. Okay, so there's a lot you can do. We're going to get into these just a little bit deeper in just a minute. Okay, but I want you to notice at least at the basic level what you can do with these. Okay, so notice I can now even manipulate the two of these kind of coming together where I have a combination of not only this particular denim seam stroke and the variable width around that stroke. All right, so now let's see what we can do to be a little bit more, I don't know, a little more controlling over it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce you to this really amazing tool called the width tool, the width tool. So let's just do that on this uh, shape right here. And I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger, just like that. That's great. Fantastic. Love it. And when I use the width tool, let's just see what it does. I'm going to click on that and you're going to see it's going to allow me to then control the width rather than actually using the variable width profiles that I have up here. I can actually do it here. And notice when I move my mouse over these individual parts, let's say I want it to be a little wider right there. 
oh my god that's so cool oh you know what i went a little bit too far all right let's just bring that again and then wait for that little guy to come up and then let's just do that okay and let's bring it out one more time let's bring on another one i click there and that's going to go a little more in all right let's get a little more creative okay and then oh interesting so i have that kind of control to do this so now i go to here and i'm going to make this go a little wider see how it's kind of active to be able to do that so you have that kind of control to change how you want your widths to be so if we go over to here choose my variable width tool now let's see what i can do to make this part just maybe go a little bit wider out nice that's much better or i'm going to come over to here and then just choose this to just kind of pinch a little bit over there Let's do one more. Let's go over to this one where I have this nice little snake here. So I'm just going to make sure this is chosen and then go to my width tool. And then guess what? Even though this is just a very simple line, I can control how wide this is going to go. So wherever there's a curve, that's going to get a little wider. Nice. Okay. This one, maybe not so much, right? So I can kind of just snip that in. Ooh, that is very cool. Let's go ahead and make this go also a little wider just click and drag out nice okay so now I've taken a very ordinary little wavy line and I'm able to actually make it into a different shape maybe you're making a mustache or a snake or you're making a road something like that and just kind of curving out giving it some perspective and what did I do I used the width tool to be able to control that all right so that's just a very basic introduction to working with the width tool in a little bit, we're going to show you how you can actually work with individual brush strokes and go even further than what we saw here. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, let's get a little bit deeper into our understanding of working with strokes. All right, so we talked a little bit about how you can work with our strokes as far as the width and the color, and then also our variable width. And also, we talked about some of these guys here. All right, fantastic. That's great. Now, sometimes what I like to do is, let me just dock this here. I like to make sure that my stroke panel is up, so I always have access to it. So go to Window, go to Stroke, that's going to be here. And then I don't see a whole lot of options until I click on my little panel menu, Show Options, and wow, there you go. So I might want to see that all the time. Now, these strokes are, yeah, sure, they're interesting, right? They're boxing something, kind of whatever they are. But I'd like to have some more interesting brush strokes for me. So where do I find more interesting brush strokes? When I clicked on this drop down, I showed you maybe about like three of these, but there are so many more than what's showing on here. Okay, so remember here, I just did that. All right, that's pretty cool. I can do that, I can do that. All right, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Go back to that one. All right, good, I'm bored. What can I do to get more brush strokes? You'll notice here in the lower left, this little guy right there, a little library, is going to show me a whole bunch of different types of strokes that I can do. If you want to convert things to arrows, you have that, artistic, right? We have all these different things that we can work with, different categories and different subcategories. So for right now, let's just choose border and then border decorative, for example. And you'll notice it actually spits out a new panel called border decorative i'm going to make that nice and tall and you'll see whoa those that's a lot holy cow who knew you could do that but what i want you to notice before we even execute anything at all is that i can now toggle throughout all of my brushes my brush libraries very very easily so watch this rather than having to go back to where i started from i can now just go through all of the brushes available and i am just like blown away that is so cool. Look at that little ants and coffee and film things and hearts and holy moly and some calligraphy. Look at that little banners, you know, and all of these, they are going to be linking up to any kind of stroke you create. It could be a very simple line that maybe you want to make a little banner heading like these guys right here. And you just want to do something like that, right? We'll show you how to do that in a second. But it's again, it all starts with a stroke. So Let's go back to where we started, banner decorative, and I'm just gonna put a decorative banner on this guy right here. I'll just choose that, and wow, amazing. 
Very, very different, very easy, very cool, very creative. Nice, I like that, pretty cool. And I can make that bigger, I can make that smaller. Of course, the size of the shape is gonna determine, hey, is this something you wanna do or not? Now, you'll also notice, because I brought out my strokes panel here, I have all kinds of options for that. So if I now choose what my corner options are going to be or my alignment options are going to be, it may allow me to then decide whether it's going to be on the outside or not. So you'll see some of these are going to be grayed out just depending on what the actual border is going to be. So if I click on this, notice it lights up and then I can now put those on the outside, the middle, all that. Some of these won't allow you to do it because they're very kind of like beefy decorative and they just, just doesn't allow it. But if you play around with it, you'll notice that many of them, in fact, will have a lot of great potential. So maybe you want to choose one that's maybe a little bit more kind of subdued than that one. Okay, maybe this one isn't. Okay, see, okay, great, not so bad. And then just play around with it. I can just go ahead and bring my weight up and then bring that down. All right, so awesome. So easy to change this to so many. Now let's go back to just drawing out a basic line. All right, so I'm just gonna do just a basic, basic line and we'll see what we can do. Even though it's not a shape, even though it doesn't have a border around it, we'll see how these little brush strokes are gonna be able to be applied the same way. All right, so my line is gonna be living inside where my rectangle and all my shapes are. And I'm just gonna simply hold down the shift key and click and drag and go over to here and guess what? Let's just find one of those little banners there. Okay, not too bad, good to go. And I click on that and whoa, I just created something pretty incredible. And I'll just go ahead and make that a little bit bigger. And then I can go over to here to my regular move tool and then make that a little longer. Let's minimize this, move that out of the way. And wow, look at that. Now you have a nice little banner that no one would ever know that you didn't draw that, <laughs> right? I mean, it's really kind of incredible how easy it is to, to draw out these very cool individual shapes, okay? But they're not really shapes. All they are are essentially just these individual strokes that have a brush stroke living on top of it, okay? So very, very cool, right? In a little bit, we're gonna learn about how you can then add on new anchor points to then even manipulate some of these things, okay? To go even further with it, okay? Even though this is just a straight line, we can learn how we can manipulate these things to really kind of take this home and then maybe even want to change the color on this by doing what's called expanding the appearance of it. So it's like, oh my God, wow, so many options, but they're not necessarily obvious. So we're gonna get into those in just a little bit. But at this point, I really want you just to take away the fact that we can bring in new brush strokes very easily and we can very simply use our brush stroke library and then bring them in. You'll see that there are like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Really experiment with them. Love to hear and see what you've created and hopefully you find this is as fun and as pretty straightforward now as I do because you'll see that there really is a method to the madness. All right, so pause the video, have fun and we will see you in the next lesson. Now, in the last few lessons, we've talked about working with shapes and the direct selection tool and also uh, working with all of our different anchor points and all that good stuff. But sometimes when we're working with these things, we might want to kind of manipulate things a little bit more. You want to kind of have them a little more nuanced. Maybe you want to make this straight line into a curve. Maybe this guy here, you want to add in some ridges, things like that. So what you can do with anchor points is essentially add on more anchor points. So you might have a shape and you wanna make it a little, a little more complex. So if you click on this shape here, you'll notice that there is literally just one line here, right? That's all this is, right? This is just one stroke we created. And of course we put this little banner around there and there's just two anchor points here, one on this side, one on that side. And with just two anchor points, I don't have a whole lot of flexibility to do things with this, okay? Because I can't like curve this, I can't really you know, do anything except for maybe resize it. 
but I might want to make this a little bit more complex. So if you, when you think about anchor points, when you think about adding on anchor points, I'm going to give you this little analogy, which is your own human body. If you look at your arm right now, you'll see that from your shoulder all the way to your wrist, there is a little elbow right there in the middle. Okay, think about that elbow as like an extra anchor point. One anchor point is your shoulder. Another one all the way goes to the end of your arm, to your wrist. And then in the middle, you have something that gives you that kind of flexibility to bend your arm. Think about your wrists. You can bend your wrists as a result. Okay, look at, look at your knee. Okay, it's like, think about it like a joint that's gonna allow you to have a little more flexibility with what you're working with, okay? So let's see how we can do that working with this little banner here. So what I'm going to do is add on a new anchor point. Okay, so if we go over to here where our pen lives, you're gonna see here's this option to add an anchor point. Now, for some of you who don't have the option that I'm showing here and some of these other options that are missing, you'll need to go down here to edit toolbar, this, these three dots, and then come way up to the top when these options come up. And then you can simply either add on all of your advanced tools by clicking on this, or you can very simply just drag them up and bring them over to the toolbar if you don't see the options you want. In this case, some of you may not see the add anchor point tool. Okay, so I'm gonna click on that. And you'll notice now my cursor now turns into a pen with a little plus sign on it. And all I'm gonna do now is add on an anchor point by simply clicking where I want that anchor point to be. And again, thinking about this as like a new joint for yourself. So I'm just gonna click on that and make sure you get it right there on the line or else you get a little error message like that. So you gotta go right very precise to get it there. It's very intolerant, so you'll see Sometimes you'll get that error message, don't freak out, just try again, or zooming in is really helpful. Okay, now you'll see, when I go back to my direct selection tool, I can simply just select that. I'm gonna use my arrow keys just to nudge that up a little bit, or to nudge it down a little bit. Okay, great, I'm gonna come back up, keep that straight. And when I do that, you will notice that it is a corner when I do that. So you'll see, if I zoom in a little bit, that it's a corner like that which isn't bad, not exactly what I want. I want it to be curved. I want it to look like a nice little kind of curved banner. So what do I do? I'm gonna convert this to a curved anchor point, okay? I don't want it to be like a hard one. So there's a number of different ways I can do this. Number one, I'm gonna bring this out here, and this time I'm gonna just tear this out, just like I've shown you with other tools. And you'll see, I have two options to do here. I can either choose this anchor point tool, which is kind of a strange name, but essentially what this is gonna do, it's gonna convert this, and I can just simply click and drag to make that into a curve. So now when I click on that, you'll see it's now a nice curve. You can see that. Let me go ahead and undo that. And some of you, maybe you don't wanna do it that way. Maybe that's a little bit too challenging or maybe not your cup of tea. So let me just undo come back to where I was. And instead, I can use this option to convert way up on top here. Well, notice how you have the option to convert either the corner to a curve or a curve into a corner. So now what I'm gonna do is just make this into my curve. And now, guess what? It is now a nice curve. So you have those two options you can do. So if I switch that back, watch this, it's no longer gonna have those Bezier handles. So when I choose this, see now it's a corner, I come over to here and now it's curved. Just like that, see, selected, easily done. So you have choices, All right? So now I can make this as curvy as I want to and I can make this go out you have all the control in the world. So let's now bring this down and bring that down. You'll see, pretty cool. You have, again, all the control in the world. All right, so next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna work with a, maybe a little bit of a different shape, which is gonna be this little pretty graphic down here, which is a very complex graphic. So if we take a look at the layers, we'll see that there's actually quite a bit happening within these groups. Okay, wow, a lot of stuff happening here. 
And also a lot of stuff happening here now. What that's telling me is that I got to really drill down. So what this is known as coming into what's called isolation mode. So I want to make like the edge of this glass, maybe a little bit kind of curvy. So I'm just going to very simply do the same thing as I just did with a simple shape on a more complex shape and make it even more complex than it is. Now, <clears throat> because this is a group, I need to actually double click to get deep into this, right? Double click. You'll notice that things change over here in the upper left. I'm now inside the group. Keep double clicking, keep double clicking, keep double clicking. And now guess what? If you look here, I am now in what's called isolation mode and I'm inside a group, inside of a group, inside of a group, finally getting to this path. And then I click on my direct selection tool and you'll notice all of these individual path points that I can now work with, right? So when I click on this here, you can see that's one kind of path point. Here's another one that's a curve. Okay, here's another one that's just a hard angle. And then here's another one that's a curve. And I can play around with these just to see what I can get now that I know how to add on anchor points. Now, you will note that you can also delete anchor points just right next door to that. So let's just see what I can do now just to make this a little bit more interesting. Notice I'm going to click. Oh, not close enough, right? It's very, very intolerant, right? So just be aware of that. You got to be right on top of it. Okay, not too bad. And now, now that I got these anchor points, guess what? I'm able to now manipulate this in maybe a slightly different way. I'm just gonna kind of bring this out here, bring this out here. I'm just using my arrow keys. All right, let me hit the plus sign to then just say, hey, listen, let's add on one more anchor point and then maybe even do another little kind of fun little jive there. Okay, and then come back to my direct selection tool. I'm gonna hit the A key this time. And now let's see. What I can do here and now I can not only do that but because this is a curve I can now manipulate this even more so so now I'm getting kind of a more interesting glass than I, I before I just had kind of a straight line I'm able to really really manipulate this to be something different okay so you'll see how you have all the control in the world of how you work with your shapes all right, so again, what did we do? We just added on anchor points, okay? That's it. Sometimes we converted our anchor points because they were a hard angle and sometimes they were a curve and we made it into a hard angle, all right, into a corner, all right? So you really wanna play around with this. We have some files for you to work with here or find some files on your own and really just get comfortable with it because this is really the cornerstone of so much that you work with in Illustrator. Okay, now I'm going to come back to where I was. I'm going to simply click on this to go all the way back. And now I can see my beautiful image there. Okay, practice up. See you in the next exercise. Let's have a quick discussion about transparency or opacity. So transparency is basically what we can see through. Opacity is what we can't see through. Now you'll see this great little illustration here has some nice little sort of translucence, right? It has the ability to kind of see through some of these shapes so I can actually make this look like a glass. So transparency or opacity is very easily done. So when I select this, I want you to notice this is now selected, this little individual shape to create these little kind of striations, right, within the glass. I want you to notice over here inside of my properties panel, I have this thing called opacity. Now, right now it is at 30%. Let's bring that up to 100% so you can see exactly what it does and what it doesn't do. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Didn't see that coming. Bring this over to here and, oh, wow, look at that, 30%. Oh, I see. So it was white and it was bringing through it whatever layer was underneath it because of the 30% opacity. Let's try this one. Let's go a little bit deeper and you'll see this one is also 30%. This one, see? So you can see how these guys work together to create this illusion of depth, to create the illusion that there is something behind it so they can all kind of work together. So if you look at the layers themselves, you'll see that there's all kinds of stuff hiding underneath it. You can see all these layers here. And as a result of being able to see through this, through our lower opacity, we're able to create the illusion of glass. 
All right. So you want to play around with that. You can kind of create some, you know, more creative things with it. My goal for you right now is just to understand how we actually apply uh, transparency um, into our graphics, into our image. All right. So you can play around with this image or try it with something else. It works really nice to have a banner that maybe something is behind the banner and you want to be able to see through that banner. Maybe you have a seascape or a cityscape, something like that and you can make that come through all right so we'll do one example like this i'll bring this down and let's just say this guy here is above right what i'm working with here let's just go just like that and if i bring down the opacity on this which is now 100 percent you'll be able to see a nice cool effect as a result of me just simply bringing down the opacity all right so practice that have fun and we'll see you in the next exercise we are now going to discuss the basics of type and topography and all of the elements that you can use with an illustrator to modify your type, format it, and really ultimately have control over the layout of your type. So very simply, I'm just going to go ahead and click on my little T over here, or I can just simply tap on the T on my keyboard and that gets activated. And very simply, I'm just going to draw out a text box. So I'm just going to draw a text box right there. And automatically, you'll notice that some type automatically comes in there. Like, oh, wait a second. I didn't ask for that. Illustrator gives you this little placeholder type, right? Text, content, copy, right? So if I don't want that to do that anymore, I can go over to my preferences. So if you're on a Windows computer, if you go to edit and you go over here to preferences, you'll see there's an option for type. Now, if you're on a Mac, you can click on the Illustrator menu in the upper left, click on Preferences, and then go to Type. And if you don't want that to do that anymore, you can just say, hey, do not fill type objects with placeholders. So you would just not do that, and then you will not get that message anymore. You will not get that set of text anymore. All right, but I'm going to keep mine just because I don't want to type anything out. I'm good to go with what I have. So we need to see more or less what this does. Right? It puts in this little placeholder text, fills it in from beginning to end, and I want to change this. I obviously don't want it to be this color, so how do I deal with that? There is a number of different ways to work with type. You'll see, based off of the context of what I've selected, I'm going to see options for my type up on top here. Great, all that stuff there. Okay, amazing. Lots and lots of cool stuff right there. You'll also see within my properties panel, also more options down here, pretty much the same thing. And likewise, if you go to window and come way down over here to type, and I'm going to open up to, let's say, character, you'll notice that character has the paragraph panel as well with it. I'm just going to close down open type for now, and then you will see. Fantastic. Good. So maybe you want to just have this kind of floating there all the time. So I'm just going to do a nice little triple click. You see that triple click selects the entire box. It's kind of nice. Or you could simply just highlight it. And from here, I could then just choose whatever type I want to apply. Pretty cool. And then we're going to go over some of these things in just a little bit. But before we go any further, let's see how we can change the color so we can actually see it, what we're working with. And that's pretty much the same thing how you work with color and shapes. So we're going to find our little color picker over here or go over here if you want to find a swatch, double click on that. And then I'm just going to choose white. OK, go over to there and then go all the way over here. And then just notice you have your RGB values, you have your CMYK. Great, fantastic. Click OK and then I click away. All right, pretty good. Pretty happy with that. Now you will notice that because I made my type a little bit bigger, I now have this little plus sign telling me that, uh-oh, the text box is not big enough anymore. So I need to fix that. So very simply, just like we do with any kind of shape, I'll see, great, now I'm good to go. I could have also made that wider. I could have also decided to make my type a little bit smaller to make that fit in, okay? Now let's talk about just some of our basics of formatting. So we have our character formats and we also have our paragraph formats. So some of these you've probably seen before, just your font type. Notice also when I click on that, I have the option to select all kinds of different fonts, but also note that I can also favorite some of these as well, so then I can come back to them anytime I want. Okay, so for example, if I love this one right here, this minion variable, I can click on that to add to favorite. 
I can come down here. Let's try another one of these. Let's go to that one. Okay, fantastic. Good, good, good. Love all that. But now when is that going to come into play? It's going to come into play when I actually just show my favorites. Essentially, I can filter this out to say, hey, listen, only show the ones that I've now just favorited. Okay, I can clear that out as well. And then to the left of that, you have all kinds of other filters depending on the classification, serif, sans serif, script, handwriting, you know, all that good stuff there. So really up to you, you can choose whatever you want, but it's really nice that it allows you to get to these very quickly. It also shows you, well, what's the history of the fonts you've worked with? Oh, great, forgot all about that one, or I really like that one, good. Now I can see that again and again and again. All right, so maybe just for now, I'll choose this kind of fun one, this Courier Prime, all right? And then, uh-oh, I have a problem here. Now, what can I do? Again, I'm gonna do a little triple click. I can now either make my type a little smaller. You see that? Oh, but that's getting a little bit too small. I still wanna make that readable. But then I could start working with other things like my letting, right? What is my letting? Letting essentially is line spacing. So notice the space between these lines. So I'm just gonna ratchet that down smaller. Okay, cool. It's still readable, but it now has just less space in between it. So therefore it fits inside the text box. Okay, so letting is essentially line spacing, right? So that's really kind of all we need to worry about for right now. But now let's check out some of these other guys here, right? Like our kerning and our tracking. What do those mean? All right, so I may actually have like some text that's a little bit too close to each other, right? That's actually making the text like not so readable, if you will. So it's like an I and an L that might be a little bit too close. This U and this M, you can see that there. Maybe I might want to make that so it's not so close together. And that is where kerning comes in, right? Where I'm going to be able to increase that space between the two of them. So now I'm going to increase the space just by going up to, let's just say, 50. Okay, very good. And you see how that just added on a little bit more, 75. Okay, good. That's a little bit easier to read. It's hard to kind of mistake the word as other words. If you want to entertain yourself, go ahead and just type out kerning fails. And you're going to see some slightly R-rated stuff in there, but pretty humorous nonetheless of how kerning can actually be really effective. And if you overlook it, it could also mess you up. So check out kerning fails if you want a, a good laugh. All right. Now, let's see what tracking does. And um, I'm going to just put in some big type here. And I'm just going to okay, say, come see us Friday night. All right, and let's change all that to a different color altogether. Let's make that white, and let's choose a nice, big, blocky font. Let's go to here, and of course I can make that size nice and big. All right, great. But I wanna make this kind of like spill straight across on my text box, so that's where my tracking is going to come in. So if I make this go like that, notice what it's doing. Okay, so oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I really like that. So it gives me all the control that I need to be able to just have this look a little bit different, look a little more like a title, if you will. Okay, so let's now just see some other things we can do. Let's go over here to our paragraph panel. And we'll see that there are some other, again, possibly similar things that you can work with in terms of your alignment, left, center, and right. You'll also see some options in terms of indenting from the left, from the right. Maybe you want to have a first line indent. So let's just see what those things look like. So with this text box selected, I can just bump that in. Okay, I like that. Yeah, I'm just gonna, rather than moving the text box, I can actually just move the type inside of there. All right, let me just put that back. What if I want to have a first line indent? What does that look like? So maybe you want to do kind of old conservative way of how we used to do it. Great, that's the traditional way to indent. Maybe you want to do that. Or again, it's really about control however you want to do it as well. All right, now let's bring that back down to zero. And now this part here is actually kind of nice when you have more than one paragraph, okay? So let me just put in a new paragraph right here. And I want to have some space in between this paragraph and this paragraph. So I can do either paragraph spacing before 
or paragraph spacing after. So if I just go just bump this up a little bit, that gives me some nice control over how my stuff is spaced out between it. So rather than having to like put a hard return or do something a little bit more sort of manual, I can use my paragraph tools to be able to do it. Okay, so lots and lots of really good stuff here. All right, and then the last one we're gonna do is this hyphenate, which I think is actually kind of important. I'm just gonna go ahead and just click anywhere in the paragraph and then just uncheck that. And then notice my hyphenations go away. Look at it before, now see it after. Look at these half hyphenations. Nope, I don't like that. And get rid of it. Okay, so super easy. Working with type is really, really nice. So we're gonna just do a couple of lessons on this. And then in some future lessons in the more advanced class, we get into working with styles, okay? And if anybody has worked with InDesign before, you'll see that paragraph and character styles could be incredibly valuable as well in terms of uh, saving time and then being very efficient, all right? And also being consistent across the board. All right, so pause the video, practice this up, get familiar with both your character and your panels of paragraph and then all the other stuff on the right side, your your properties and everything on the top as well and have fun. See you in the next video. So what we're going to do in this lesson is learn about type on a path. So right now you see that Bilbo watches you as you sleep is inside of this circle. Okay. Do you see that? And this circle is a path, but what you don't know is that there's an actual official path that is inside of the circle that you can't see, but the type, conforms to that path. Now remember what a path is. A path is pretty much just like any vector shape that you can kind of go around, right? So it could be just a simple line. It could be a triangle. It could be a circle like this. It could be anything. Like we could even do one around Bilbo's ears if we want to, around a mountaintop. Okay, so you can do it along his whiskers if you like. This is the path that we might be typing around. Okay, so how do we actually do that? I'm going to just blot this out and I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm just gonna call this type on a path. Great, fantastic, I'm there, I'm good to go. And I'm gonna draw out a circle that's just gonna be a path that's just gonna be right in the middle here and then come out and then I'm gonna type along that path. All right, so let's just choose our circle. I'm gonna make it so I have no fill and a black stroke, very good. And then my stroke doesn't even need to be that thick, it's no problem but of course it's not gonna matter in a little bit. And then I'm gonna just draw out from the center and you may actually use a guide to do this. Maybe that's something you wanted to do ahead of time, totally up to you, but I'm just gonna just eyeball it for right now and just draw out my circle concentrically. We've done this in a few other exercises by holding down shift and alt or option if you're on a Mac. And then notice that it's coming in, nice little circle there. I'll just bump that up a tiny bit, okay? Love that, and then maybe I'll just bring that tiny bit smaller, make some room for my type. And then, great, good to go. Now let's actually do some typing along that path. So how do I do that? I'm gonna go over here to my type tool, but I'm gonna right click this time. You'll notice here is this type on a path tool. All right, very good. And watch what happens now when I simply move my mouse right over that line, I'm gonna get this eye bar with a little wavy doodad right there, okay? I click on that and you'll see, uh-oh, pretty cool, but okay, brought in all that placeholder text, which is no problem because I wanted to see how big it was anyway. So then I can just take a look at that font, okay? Great, no problem. And now I can just simply type right over this. So Bilbo watches you as you sleep. Look at that, look how cool it is, how it's conforming to my circle, right? The circle that I just drew. And then notice I can still select my text like I normally would with anything else. And then I'm going to use my keyboard shortcut, which is just control shift. And then the little, it's the period. And if you're on a Mac, it's command shift and the period. Or of course you can go up to here to do that. All right. And then maybe I want to change this to a different font altogether. All right. And then I'll make that nice and big. Okay. Pretty cool. All right. Now, this obviously is not how I want it. So I can use some of my tools like my tracking to make it spread out a little bit further. So let's do that. Let's get a little review on how we do that. So let's go over here to window type and I'll bring up my characters again, All right? And then 
watch this, how I can now just make this go a little bit more. So, okay, pretty cool. I like that. Now, it's still maybe not perfect for you. And this is maybe the trickiest part of working with type on a path. And that's being able to move it along the path how you'd like to move it. So I'm gonna to go to my direct selection tool and I want you to notice these little guys right here. There are two little what I call bookends. This is the beginning of your type in a path and this is the end, believe it or not, right? And oh, that's weird. Oh, that's right, because I started off with a lot of type. So it's like, oh, I just brought that in. Now, the thing to notice, and this is incredibly important, is this, when I move my mouse right over here to the edge right there, notice how underneath my arrow, I get like a little line with a left pointing arrow. And when I move my mouse over to here, I get another one with a right facing arrow. I'm gonna move this one just down a little bit because that's my end end. And this is my beginning beginning. So now if I go to here, wait for that, and then I can now move this along the path. So let's do that so you can actually see it. So got to be sometimes actually pretty close to get to it. Try not to click on this because it'll ask you if you want to move it someplace else. Just wait for that. It's really important to wait for that or else you get a little message. You're like, I don't want to do that at all. Okay, and now notice how I can just see where it's going to go. It's perfect. Love that. All right, and awesome. Now let's go ahead and just shrink it in a little bit more. And watch as I change the shape, the text comes with me. Okay, very, very cool. All right, and now just for fun, let's change the color to whatever. Okay, let's maybe just do it red. He's scary. All right, and then again, just for fun, let's put a nice little stroke around it. I'll just make that black, maybe a little bit thicker. Let's see. Zoom out a little bit, get rid of this guy, don't need it. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. You'll just play around with whatever you like in terms of your font and everything. The takeaway here is it is super easy to do type on a path and to be really creative with it, okay? And then you don't need to actually see the shape. You can just have it, you know, zigzagging and wavy, going around in a circle, you know, whatever kind of projects you're working on. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, I wanna introduce you to the appearance panel. Appearance panel is pretty incredible uh, to give you lots of information, but also allow you to really make changes right there on the panel itself. So if I go over here to window, you will see I have the appearance panel and you'll see it says no selection. When I click on this right here, you'll notice now it has my characters that's selected and it's telling me that I have a stroke of two points and I also have a fill of a particular color, I can simply click on this and then I can actually make a change to that thing that I have selected. Oh, great. So if I wanted to make this a little bit thinner, I can absolutely do that. If I wanted to change the color to one of my swatches, I can absolutely do that and actually find all my swatches right within there. I'm gonna keep this as is. Okay, and the same thing with my fill, all right? So you'll wanna kind of keep an eye on your appearance panel, regardless of what your actually doing whether it's a stroke something like that but it could be you're working with more like graphic styles you know and all kinds of other different elements maybe it's a gradient so you can really see what's going on but also control it so let me show you one thing you might decide to do and that is going to be maybe putting multiple strokes on something okay so in order to actually do this the way that illustrator wants me to do it as far as adding on multiple strokes is I have to remove this stroke and kind of start from the beginning so I can work with my appearances accordingly. So let me just delete this one right here and you'll see that no longer do I have a stroke on here. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this whole area just like this. I'm selecting the type itself, but I'm selecting the whole text box, if you will. All right, now, if you'll notice over here in the lower left, there is this add a new stroke and also add a new fill. And then in my advanced class, I talk about some of these effects that we can apply as well. All right, so very simply, I'm gonna say add a new stroke and that comes up. Okay, pretty cool. I've already done that before, no big deal. And maybe I'm gonna make that bigger. All right, and maybe this time I'll make it a different color. Okay, pretty neat. But now what if I wanna do multiple strokes? So guess what? I can add on another one 
just like that. And now notice, I actually have two strokes happening simultaneously. And all it did really was just duplicate it. Okay, that's really all it did. But what I'm gonna do for this top one is I'm gonna make this black and I'm gonna make that grow a little bit. So now you'll be able to see, that didn't come in black. Okay, there we go. Now we'll be able to see both of them simultaneously. One is kind of shrouding the other. So let's make this one a little bit bigger and I'll be able to see, oh, pretty neat. Now I can actually have something a little bit more interesting for me to work with. Let me just make this even thinner so it doesn't kind of blot it out so much. All right, let's go over to here. And now, okay, not bad. And then I think maybe I would choose a different font to make this a little bit more interesting looking. So let's just try that. And let's maybe he's like military. Okay, very good. And then come over to here. And if you recall, I can now move this guy down a little bit and then don't run into this, right? Very important. And now let's go to here. Very tight there. Okay, and then I'm gonna do a triple click on that and then just make my font a little bit smaller. And then of course, remember, I can play around with anything in my paragraph and also in my character, another way to get to your character panel. And then let me just bring down my tracking. So then that's gonna be a little bit closer together. Maybe even they overlap a bit going negative. And then lastly, let me just do this last one here. Just drag that so it's kind of equidistant. All right, pretty cool. I like that. So if we zoom in, we'll be able to see I now have two strokes happening simultaneously on this set of text. Why? Because of my appearance panel. All right, so if you're planning on doing something like this, start off with no content on there, right? And then just apply all of your content, particularly with strokes, on here as well, okay? And if you want to do any one of these to experiment with, add a new fill, add a new effect, go ahead and do that, all right? And likewise, you will see, by the way, that you have an appearance panel here, but it doesn't necessarily give you all the same kind of options and functionality. So we want to work with the appearance actual panel, not the appearance section within the properties, okay? So hopefully that's clear. All right, so pause the video, practice this, right? And practice it with the circle if you want to, if, it, if text is a little bit too much, just by having kind of multi-layers to be able to just have some more dynamism and some more visual interest, okay? See you in the next lesson. Now we are ready to finally export our content, save it as maybe another file type, and maybe we wanna package it, could be PDF, could be just another Adobe Illustrator, could be an EPS file. Let's explain what that is. Now, if you are exporting, we talked about one way you could do it. It's just simply just to select your object and then you can right click. Notice here is this export selection. We also discussed how you can go through your window and then go over here to asset export and you can export these as individual objects if you like, right? So go back to an earlier video on that, but you can see very easy, we can do that. Now, if you're going to be exporting your entire document and maybe all of your artboards in such a way, you can do it in a number of different ways. Now, before we even get into that, let's talk about how we can preview what it's going to look like. Now, you will see over here in the far lower left is this change screen mode. If you simply click on that, you're gonna see there's this presentation mode or just simply shift F. So I'm gonna click on that. You're gonna see, oh, because I have these three artboards, it allows me just to go through these one by one, right? Kind of cool, so you can see that before you even send it out. You know what's gonna look like, nice and clean. There's nothing extra in there if you don't want it. Pretty cool. There's a few other options in here as well. If you wanna do just normal screen mode where we are at here, and then full screen mode with menu bar. Okay, all right, you can do that. Let's switch that back. And let's go over here to normal again. Go to here and then full screen mode, and that takes you to that. Okay, and then I'm gonna hit the escape key to get back out of it. You also know that you can hit the tab key is another thing to do. And you can also hit just the shift tab key, which just gets rid of all your kind of like major right-sided panels, okay? So I can just bring that right back. So there's gonna be some kind of like precursor things that you do. Now, if we are ready to now save it and package it and everything, you can go over here to file. And you'll see there's an option for export. If you want to export, export for screens, it's going to come up. It's going to be very similar to what we just saw before and even in some earlier lessons. Maybe you want to export 
all of your artboards, only some of your artboards, just some of your assets if you want to. These are in our assets folder. Where are you going to save it to? And essentially, what kind of file format do you want to Okay, save it as? All right now, if I click on file, maybe I want to export in a very different way. Let's go ahead and just do a save as, and then maybe you just want to save it as a PDF. Notice also you can save it as an AI file, which hopefully you're doing already. And then here's also an EPS, encapsulated postscript. Maybe you are doing that because you're sending it to somebody who does not read Illustrator files. Maybe it's an older Illustrator file. Maybe it's just something that they're just, a, it's a vector reading program, like maybe it's a 3D, a 3D printing device. Could be so many, so many different reasons. Okay, and we talked about SVGs earlier, scalable vector graphics. Maybe you want to do that as well. Okay, so you'll know when the time comes, but you can very, very easily do that. So if I wanted to save this as a PDF right now, I can click on save. Do so you want to replace it? I already have that there. I'm going to say yes. Okay, very good. Let's just change that to Avo yes. And I click on save. And now this pops up to a bunch of my PDF presets. Okay, so essentially, what do I want to do in terms of my compression, my security, my bleeds, all this good stuff here. All right, so what's my compatibility? I'm going to make it the most recent one if possible. Go over here to compression. How am I compressing my images? Do you want to downsample at all? Totally up to you. How do you want to work with your marks and bleeds? Do you want them shown up? But when you do send this to the printer, are you going to have some bits of information in there that you want that to be clear? And then if we go over here to output, this is really about your color conversion. If you need to do this at all, you'll see here, go ahead and convert it. Maybe some of your images are not CMYK. You want to convert them to RGB. And let's just jump over here to security. That might be, hey, something a little bit more important for you is, hey, do you want to require a password to open the document? Yes or no, cool. Or do you want to use a password to restrict editing Okay, including like any kind of editing at all, right? Printing, all this kind of stuff here that you can do here. So if you choose this, it's all gonna light up. What do you want to allow happen? Maybe you want to have it, maybe you don't, but you can simply password protect that. All right, and then this is just gonna give you a summary of everything you've chosen. And then you click on save. And now that's gonna be saved as a PDF for you to send that out, package it, whatever you want to do afterwards. Okay, now you also will notice that there is in fact a package option for you. Well, when you click on that, it's gonna give us you know, everything here in terms of where it's gonna go, what's gonna be the folder name, it's gonna create a new folder. And then if you're working with links, right? So a link in this case is a link that's linking up to an outside document, image, or whatever that you have placed into your Illustrator file, you want to copy that so then therefore when you print it out, your printer will actually have access to those links. So therefore you don't have to reset that all over again, okay? Same thing for fonts, right? You don't wanna have to actually have low quality for your images. You don't wanna have low quality for your fonts or they can't find the fonts and they accidentally choose a different font, right? Or maybe it's intentional because they don't have it. Just know that that's what packaging is gonna allow you to do because when you do in fact package, you're going to see that it's going to then create a new folder with all of the links that you've created based on things you've placed, as well as all of your fonts that you're using. I'm not really using any of these things in my document, but know how easy it is to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on package. They're asking, just telling me some copyright stuff here. I'm gonna say, okay. All right, package created sex successfully. And then I can just say show package and then you can see, there it is. There's my PDF it created. All right, there's some instructions potentially if you want to put that in there. All right, then I'm pretty much good to go. All right, and then with this guy, more or less be the same thing, but it's gonna see, you're gonna see here, it's not gonna be several pages. It's just going to be just one page. All right, so let's just take a look at what we created. Open up to my PDF, and now you can see one, two, three individual pages, and that looks pretty slick. All right. So congratulations, we are on the tail end of this class. Please practice, watch this as many times as you need to and um, use the courseware. And then please come back with any comments or questions. We're happy to address anything um, in the channel. And uh, we'll see you in the next lesson, I hope, on um, Illustrator Advanced. Good luck and have fun.
Thank you for watching, everyone. This concludes our Introduction Illustrator class. Congratulations! We covered a lot in this class. We learned how to draw vector images from scratch, modify your drawings using various tools, including the direct selection tool, the shape tools, anchor point tools, the Bezier handle. We also learned about layer management, colors, swatches, and gradients. We also covered some pretty neat tips on working with brush strokes, typing on a path, how to create both simple and complex illustrations, and of course, a lot more. Now there is a good deal more Illustrator to learn, so please check out our other video on Advanced Illustrator where we dive into even more creative features like symbols, live paint, tracing, 3D type, filters, special effects, and a lot more. Thank you again and hope to see you in the next class. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.